now I'm going to tweet it out as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is the awkward part at the beginning. Hopefully, <clears throat> are we live now? We are live. Thank oh, you for hello. being here, everyone. Yes. Yes, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Matthew, as your as your guest. My first time on on your uh, your live stream. You're often live streaming with other people, and I'm often kind of jealous. So I'm oh. happy I get to be part of one of the uh, the Mr. Beat live stream. Well, oh, I'm sorry that I left you out before. <laughs> oh no, it's fine. You're you're often not putting them on. I feel like you know you're often a guest on other people's multi person live streams as well you're in high demand i know that so well i have a hard time saying no so uh-huh <laughs> a lot of times but yeah um th tonight uh is brought to you by caffeine um I had a long <laughs> day myself you've had a long day i don't know if you even drink caffeine um, that's I not one not. of the questions <laughs> okay i already knew that anyway um but yeah we there's a lot that um you and i don't know about each other and you know um uh, I think we've met up in person a couple times at this point, but, and, you know, chatted online over the last years. Uh, but uh, we, we thought this would be a fun way to, uh, it's, it's working. Um, it'd be a, a fun way to not only um, try to entertain all of you, because that's the reason why we do this is for you watching right now. Um, but to get to know each other as well, it's an excuse to kind of um, get to know each other. Um, so each of us uh, have 10 questions for each other, and they are open-ended, uh, presumably. The idea is, uh, you know, the answers will be probably a little bit more complex, so this might take some time. So, uh, but yeah, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. Uh, thank you, JV Tone Love Rushy. Hi from Brazil. Love both channels. Awesome. I love... I'm a, I have a, a soft spot for um, my South American viewers, just in general. In general, like I get a lot, a lot of nice comments from. Uh, well, I guess it goes back to my Paraguay Uruguay video, but they're like, <laughs> for doing this video. Um, yeah, I hope to make my way down there again. With anyway, so uh, most of our audiences like overlap. <laughs> I, I say. think so. Yeah. So, but just in case there's somebody watching that doesn't know who you are, maybe give the, your little elevator pitch. Like, who are you? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm 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 JJ. I am also a YouTuber. Um, I make videos. So on my sort of channel slogan is I make videos about basically three topics that I'll start with: C, countries, culture, and Canada. And I live in Vancouver. <laughs> So a lot of my content revolves around sort of the Canadian uh, experience in various ways. But then I also make a lot of videos just about sort of cultural topics more broadly, you know, what defines the culture of different societies and, and different nations and different uh, countries and sort of how it manifests, you know, it manifests in the form of, of politics, it manifests in the form of sort of historical memory, it also manifests in the form of, of of physical objects, which I'm quite interested in as well, sort of the the cultural significance of uh, of food and you know toys and art and media and all of this kind of thing. So I would say, broadly speaking, those are the kind of things I talk about in my channel. For anybody that's interested, yeah, I would sum it up by just you're very much a cultural geography channel. Like it's it's always something to do with culture and. What's weird is like a lot of people say this too. I'm not just like, this is, th these aren't original thoughts, but like <laughs> we kind of found each other because like you're, I'm like the American version of you. You're like the Canadian version <laughs> of you in some Because we have social studies channels, but we're not really, a lot of um, history or geography YouTubers are have more of a, uh, a niche, I guess, like where they're more laser focused, like, oh, I'm do I do military history or I'm doing only geography or physical geography or American history we kind of delve into all kinds of things. <laughs> We're not mm -hmm. afraid to like, you know, like I'm just going to make a video about China, even though I've never been there type of deal. Yes. So, yes, uh, yes. But yeah, I think you're more tra well traveled than I am. Uh, wow. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Hey, Emperor Tiger stars in the chat. Hey, Oh boy. Speaking of geography. Yeah. Uh, if you two had to move to each other's country, which state province would you choose? Well, I can answer that really quickly already. 
You like uh, you like where I live right now, I do. don't you? you, British, you Columbia. Do like British Columbia. Yeah. British Columbia is my favorite place on the planet, and that's where, where JJ happens to live. What about you? I've tried to convince you to move certain places. Do you I know mean, where? I like I, I I like so many different parts of America. It's it's a hard question because I've thought about you know living in in the states, and I often sort of get uh, sort of caught up on where specifically I I would live. I mean, it's not an impossible proposition that I could that I could live in the States. I mean, I like California a lot. I really like the weather. I think like many Canadians, when I think about the States, I think about a warmer climate than the one that I'm used to. So definitely like being in a place like California, which is also a state that I've spent a lot of time in, I think is very compelling. But you know, I do like small town America a fair bit or, or sort of Midwestern America. We, the two of us were in Iowa uh, not long ago and, uh, you know, in Des Moines and places like that, I, I'm, I really find those kind of parts of America very compelling. I was in uh, Minneapolis, you know, maybe that's not quite small town, but you know, it's Midwest and I really had a great time when I was there as well. So, but the problem with, with the Midwest is that you have very sort of, I think, Canadian style weather. And so that's uh, perhaps less of a uh, improvement. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, uh, I, I'm i a big fan of Iowa City in particular, and we went through there a couple weeks ago. So, yeah, it's uh, – let me know if you if you move to Iowa. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I guess we'll go ahead and do this. You, you wanted me to ask my question first, but, yeah. again, we have 10 questions for each other. We don't know – we didn't tell each other these questions ahead of time, all right? Yes. We, this is all – so it's a little exciting here. Uh, hopefully I won't offend you with any of these questions. <laughs> These questions. Okay. My first question is, this is easy. Okay. So do you consider yourself more of an educator or a journalist and why? I definitely consider myself more of an educator in terms of sort of what I do with my channel. <clears throat> uh, for those who don't know, I do actually have a formal journalism job as well. I write a weekly column for the Washington Post about uh, Canadian politics. The way I describe it is I I write a weekly column about Canadian politics for an international audience because, of course, I'm writing for the Washington Post, which is not a Canadian paper. I write for a section that's called the Global Opinion Section. So in theory, it's it's a sort of section that aims to have a global audience rather than just a, an American audience. So sometimes people say, like, you know, I'm describing Canadian politics for Americans, but I, I think of it in a kind of broader sort of sense. Um, but you know, that is a small part of my life. Like that is not what I do as my full-time job anymore. It is not the major source of my income anymore. The major source of my income and, and what I spend most of my, my week working on is my YouTube videos. And these videos are, I think, educational. They're my attempts to sort of explain concepts or topics that I think are worth sort of intellectually engaging with, but then also like the goal in mind is to sort of help communicate what I've learned to the audience. And so in that sense, it's a very sort of strictly educational exercise. But, you know, my videos, I don't think are journalistic in any sort of real way. I mean, I, I do investigations, you know, I do research, but, you know, it's it's not the kind of research that I would associate with with sort of serious journalistic undertaking. You know, there's not substantial interviews there's not substantial travel you know i don't I'm not talking to people on the phone i'm not you know doing reports in any sort of way it's more like more equivalent to like writing a report for school or something like that and, and researched in a similar kind of way i'm actually not sure if there's a if there's that much substantial journalism that is done on youtube what would what would you yeah. say to that most i would agree with that i was going to say that most of so-called journalism uh is reactions to true journalism you know like yes. one person's out there like i've been watching vice news a lot more lately and there's this woman who who was in yemen reporting and she went then she went to palestine and israel and i was like she was like she was she went down a tunnel and was talking to uh hamas leaders in like deep underground in these tunnels i'm like that's journalism yes, and yes, all the rest yes. of us are just like we're nobodies like uh and i have a journalism degree and don't do you have a journalism degree or is it no i didn't i, I, I didn't study <laughs> journalism even though i've worked in it for so long but it's but it's interesting like it's interesting what you said because it's like the journalism that you do see on youtube tends to be done by outlets like vice or or whatever that are actual sort of media journalistic outlets independent of their youtube channel 
right? Whereas yeah. I, I don't think that, at least I can't really sort of think of off the top of my head, many just independent sort of user-driven channels like ours that have a sort of substantial journalistic, uh, you know, sort of mission, right? I think it's mostly just the journalism that you see done on YouTube at best is just the YouTube arm of some larger media enterprise, whether that's Vice or Vox or, you know, or one of the more mainstream outlets, you know? Yeah, I mean, because we just don't have the resources. A lot of us are just one person shows and we don't have a team. <laughs> uh, although I've been trying to do more of that stuff, you know, going and getting out of my basement and interviewing people. Uh, we've had some super chats. I, uh, I'll try to give you a shout out real quick. Uh, Brandon says, love Iowa City, currently getting my medical education there. Cheers to you both. Yeah, we love nice. hanging out in Iowa. Des Moines was great. Yeah, um, was great. Dylan Patton, a long time viewer, says, so glad to see you both together. Uh, Matt, you're the man, also read part of your book to my nephews. Well, thank you. <laughs> JJ, this uh, this Quebecer loves you. <laughs> <laughs> the Quebecers always need a, need a, need a feel, <laughs> need the, uh, feel they have to sort of preface their liking for me by noting that they like me as a Quebecer because I'm sort of yeah. seen as a great villain, I suppose, over there. <laughs> oh, I forgot I can show these. Okay. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, West just wanted is... to say thank you. Oh, that's so cool. I had no idea that this technology existed. I, it's like yeah, the world so there, of the future. There's the, your Quebecer that loves you, Dylan. Nice. Yeah, I forgot. Is this... Is this is this we're doing this through YouTube that the comments appear, or is this through the this streaming is through app a using? third party site called Streamyard that I um, went ahead oh, yeah. and got the monthly thing, so it's premium. But oh. yeah, I if you want to, want to get in on that, uh, that's very cool. Oh, check this out. Yeah, well, thank Two of you. My faves by True Critique. And nice from Canada. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, so uh, before you ask your first question, I did want to say, um, oh, what was it? I lost my thought. Um, Oh, something about what you said at the very beginning. Oh, I lost it. About Maybe journalism, I'll... about like what I do with my channel. Oh, how it's. I know, know what I was going to say. Um, literally, you are the only reason why I know anything about what's going on with Canadian politics these days. Like, you're my go to person. And I don't know if that, I don't want to put that pressure on you, but. I think most Americans just, we don't really follow it, you know, other yeah. than maybe occasionally, oh, Trudeau, you know, like we, so like, uh, I think what you do is really important just for like American, dumb Americans like me who are not paying attention. Um, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Andrew Yang is uh, somebody that uh, I uh, I definitely am a fan, on, fan of. I've not hid that. Uh, I like his forward party idea, especially because it's, it's not very partisan. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. <laughs> You, you like the party? I mean, I like Andrew Yang as well. I just question if if sort of a new political party is, is the best well, way to come to. At first I was skeptical, but then I heard an, uh, a podcast where he was explaining that, you know, this isn't about like trying to spoil elections on major yeah. tickets. It's supposed to be a more of a grassroots thing. And he, he wants to focus on local elections. Yeah. And he says that they're they're meant to endorse Republicans and Democrats just as much as like, it doesn't have to be a separate thing basically to increase yeah. tribalism and partisanship. Um, so so sort know. of in, it's sort of in the mode of the, of the parties that they have in New York, right. Where they have like, you know, the conservative party and then the working families party and these kinds oh, of things that, yeah. that endorse other parties as well. Sometimes they run their own candidates. Sometimes they endorse Republicans or Democrats and the party system in New York is, is quite, distinct in that way. So I, it makes sense that Andrew Yang, a New Yorker, would sort of be perhaps thinking of that as the model that his party's going to exist in. Yeah. And even historically at the national level, uh, you know, you had, oh gosh, there's a, even a term for it, but like um, I'm blanking on it right now, but um, like, you know, for example, in the 1890s, um, the populist party, um, they endorsed a democratic candidate uh, fusion. That's the word fusion. Oh, yes. Uh, Fusionism. Uh, so yeah, Dylan's actually from Ontario. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, he still. <laughs> he wants Harper to run in twenty twenty five, which is uh, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, second thought: I don't know a lot about his channel. I think well, from sometimes I've watched videos that are. I think he's he's more political than he used to be. Um, he's. I think he used to be purely educational, but then kind of. 
now he's like more activist side. So like I haven't watched more of his activist stuff, but his more educational stuff I really liked. I, I do not know this. Uh, oh no, yeah, I don't know this channel at all. Yeah, he's from Texas. Uh, you should check out his channel. Um, is he a is he a conservative or a liberal? He is probably I would say left leaning from what okay. I've gathered from his activist stuff. Uh, all right, shall I ask you my question, Matthew? Yes, go ahead. Finally, okay. your first question. <laughs> no, no, it's it's all good. Um, I'm nervous. One one thing, like this isn't this isn't the question, but what what year were you born? Uh, 1981. So I'm approaching the big four zero here pretty soon. Well, that's exciting. But that was that was sort of the the personal question I wanted to ask you because I've often I've often thought of you as a person that's kind of in a sort of strange place generationally. Like I often, I've done a few videos where I've talked about the concept of generations. And I think a lot of people are really into this idea now. Are you a millennial? Are you a Gen Xer? Are you a boomer? Whatever. Are you a Zoomer now? <laughs> and like, I'm myself a kind of like old millennial, according to sort of the tracks. I was born in 1984, you know? And so there's like aspects where I can already sort of kind of relate to some aspects of, of sort of Gen X culture more than maybe millennial culture. But to me, you are in an even more kind of ambiguous category because you were not born in the 70s, which is sort of when I think the Gen X kind of stereotype is. But you were also, I feel like a lot of ways, I don't think of you as somebody that is that generationally different than I am. There's only like, you know, a, a couple of years apart. So I was just wondering, like, how do you sort of identify as, as a generation? And is, is this a concept that you have any sort of strong feelings on one way or another? <laughs> that's a great, great question. And by the way, that saying that's a great question is, is become cliche at this point. Um, I identify more as a millennial strongly. And um, because frankly, um, most of my friends and most people that I like that get me excited about it, about life um, are younger than me. And um also, I, you know, I've taught in the classroom the last 12 years, and I just felt like it was always easier for me to connect with younger people. Um, just there's a certain age, and I can't really put my finger on it, where people just become boring to me. And I know that sounds <laughs> horrible. That sounds horrible to say. But like where they, they become way too cynical, and they just kind of like, like my neighbor, Um He's a great guy. I, I I love Bruce, but sometimes he can just, I look, I'm just like, hey, you know, they have solid state batteries now, you know, and the technology is getting a lot better. Oh, it will never work out. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I get more hope out of young, the younger folks. Um, now, there's actually, as you said, I'm like in a special spot. And I think my wife, uh, born in 1983, is also in this category. I think it's 1977 to 1983. Do you know what I'm talking about? Xenial? Yeah, yeah. I think I talked about that in my video because I think, yeah. You, you, when did you say it goes to? Uh, well, let's look it up. Let's look it up using the screen share. This is a good opportunity for this gimmick, Matthew. Say, um, is it Xenial? Z Z Z Z Xenial? No, that's not it. <laughs> It's a mix, uh, mix it's like, I think it's, I think it's X annual is how they said it. But. That's what it is. Yeah. Oh, there's even a wiki page, Wikipedia page. And it all started a couple of years ago. This article was written about it. Um, I think this is the one here or maybe, maybe not, but yeah, um, we'll just go to the Wikipedia. So, oh, the Oregon trail generation. It's so funny cause I've live streamed myself playing Oregon trail. Um, but yeah, like I totally identify with this, like, um, there's something about like if you're born between the years 1977 and 1983, you have this weird ability to like connect with older people and younger people. And I think it has to do with the fact that we and I you probably identify as this, too. Would you identify as this, you say? Yeah, I, I, I would say so. Uh, probably a little bit less than you just because there's a couple of age uh, years different. Like to me, it is it's it's quite hard for me to fully relate to people who were born in the 1970s, right? But like that's, you yeah. weren't born in the 70s. You were also born in the 80s. I mean, there's only three years apart between the two of us. So, I mean, it's, uh, but I mean, like, but the thing is that when you're young, like a single year can be a big deal, right? So it's mm -hmm. like you were in high school for, you know, in a different, you know, phase than I was, right? Like you were in, you went through the grades at a different sort of schedule than I did. And so like that, that kind of stuff is, is sort of significant in some ways, because it means, you know, as a young person, so much of your sort of culturalization is informed by like pop culture and stuff. 
And so I'm sure that even though there's only three years between us, you probably have some sort of touch tones in the pop culture space that put you more in common with people sort of older than yourself. Then yes. that would be hard for me to sort of fully ra uh, relate to. Do you feel like, like you're probably more of yeah. a Star Wars fan than I am, for instance. Like was uh, Star Wars a big thing when you were young? Yeah, well, yeah, I have I have friends my age that love Star Wars, but I would my example because I'm not really the biggest Star Wars fan. Sorry okay. to my uncles who actually worked on the movies. Um, <laughs> one of them lives in Vancouver, by the way. Shout out oh, to absolutely. Uncle Donnie, um, and thank you, Joe, for that uh, the nice words and super chat. Um, no, I would say my better example for me is grunge. Like, okay, uh, because I was a little too young for that. Like, I didn't even find out who Kurt Cobain was until I found out on the news that he died. I'm like, who's that? You know, and then then after that is when I started listening to Nirvana. And I think another like I, I bring this example up also because like I remember the first website I went on uh, in seventh grade and it was my friend Dan. I'm still friends with him. Shout out to Dan. Uh, we went to nirvana.com or something, or maybe we yes. went to America online or, you know, Netscape. I don't know if you remember Netscape, but we were so excited because we were looking up this, uh, the lyrics or something that we didn't know or for, he's like, what was he, what was he saying in this song? And, and we would like, um, it, a bar would go across the screen and it would take like, like the, the web page took at least five minutes to load. We yes, had yes. that slow dial up internet. So being there for the dawn of the internet, like I, I remember in, uh, the year, in the year 2000 when I set up my first Hotmail account, email yes. account, and there was the Hotmail jokes back then, but you, you might remember that. Uh, and then I remember AIM, uh, Instant Messenger. Like, so, you know, I was there for the early, like Friendster, MySpace. And I, you know, because I've been there through the, the dawn of it, like, you could say all you want about these newer websites like Snapchat, TikTok. It's just basically <laughs> at this point, it's uh, slightly modified from something from before. And it's been an easy trans. Like if there's a new website thrown my way, I can figure it out. Like Discord a couple of years ago, like, oh, like if you, if you have a Gen X person on Discord, they're just like, oh, I don't, I just, I can't. Do it. <laughs> Me like, and my wife are like, oh yeah, Discord is fine. We, we figured it out after a week where, you know, we know all the lingo and stuff. So what do you think about that? I'm sure, do you remember this? This is sort of like a very uh, sort of, I think, generational memory that I have, which is the idea like there was a sort of phase when I was young where like knowing about computers was like a very particular sort of person. Like that, that, like I can remember when I was like in elementary school, like there was this kid, my friend Ryan Rondo, and like he knew about computers and like no one else knew anything about computers. And like knowing about computers, like put you in this very sort of like narrow subculture. Like it's, I think like where the cliche of like the computer nerd, which is kind of like yeah. not really a thing that I think really exists anymore because everybody's kind of a computer nerd now. But it's like, I'm sure that's probably something that you have memories of. Like, do you remember like the, the computer nerd is kind of like a stock character in life? Yeah, but middle school, I think it started to yeah. fade away. By the time I was in high school, I think that was already fading away. I mean, uh, because like everybody had a computer by that point, you know. Uh, so I think that was a turning point. But like you said, you have, yeah, we remember it. Did you have computers in elementary school? I had, well, the Oregon Trail, there was one computer in my um, second grade maybe third grade classroom that had, uh, or, you know, the floppy disk organ trail. Yes, on it. Yes, and, yes. Uh, but yeah, I think it, it wasn't until middle school where I saw more than one computer in a room, basically where we had computer labs where we learned how to type, you know, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And it was MS DOS. It was still MS DOS. I remember that C dot slash, whatever, how you had to load up the programs. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh yeah. Shout out to Judo Joker, longtime viewer. And uh, have you heard of aristocracy? Aristocracy? I have not. I'm always interested in the existence of other of other uh, of other Canadian channels. There's like you were praising me, you know, earlier, Matthew. You sort of said that, like, oh, you know, you learn all of your Canadian stuff from me, and that's very flattering. It's it's not it's not great though. Because like, I, I, no, I mean, like, you know, I, I have integrity. I mean, people should obviously listen to me, but you know, like I, I do wish that the space was perhaps a little bit more dynamic, you know, Canada is yeah. a country of 38 million people. It is, it is a little bit strange to me that like, I, um, you know, become so dominant as sort of the, the go-to Canadian guy on YouTube. 
because you know there's a lot of it, it seems disproportionate like there's so many good canadian commentators and writers and journalists and stuff out there like the, our newspapers are full of them our television stations are full of them it is a bit curious that there's just so few Canadians on YouTube who are kind of making overtly Canadian content. And I don't quite know why that is because like I've been successful doing it and, and my audience is not even primarily Canadian. So. Yeah, that should have been one of my questions for you is like your demographics. Like, cause I, I have always been curious about that. You told me kind of at one, one point that isn't, what is your biggest audience? What country is your biggest audience? Is it the United it's, States? It's, it's mostly, it's mostly Americans and, and, you know, Canadians are, are a faction of it. They're the next largest faction, but I've actually been rejected by advertisers for not having enough Canadians. Like they wanted to target the Canadian market and then they're kind wow. of shocked to learn that I have so many Americans watching rather than, than uh, Canadians. But I mean, like, that's interesting because the argument would be that like, you know, I think the reason why a lot of other Canadian YouTubers don't make sort of overtly Canadian content would be because they assume it will sort of turn off Americans. But I have found that I mean, there's a lot of Americans like yourself who are very interested in what's going on in Canada and sort of feel self-conscious that they don't know more about it. So I, I have not found my Canadian uh, focus to be uh, in any way a sort of detriment. I, I think it's a, it's an advantage if anything. So I'm yeah. And well, I think it's an American problem in general. We're just so American centric about everything. And um, we that's a long, really, story in itself. But um, there's, I, I guess we can just try to answer these. But we've only made it through one of our questions. <coughs> we'll do this and then we'll go back to our questions. Okay. Yes. Uh, with the GOP not really knowing what direction it wants to go in right now, what do you think the possibility of a Ron Paul type figure training the GOP? You know, what's interesting about that is um, I think it's already gone in a populist direction. And so Ron Paul was he tapped into that. Um, it wasn't just I mean, also libertarianism has many shades. And I think the economic libertarianism that he endorses still is is already a mainstay of the, of the GOP. Um, when you say that it doesn't know what direction it wants to go. I don't know if I agree with that. I think yeah, I don't agree with that. Yeah, like they're already saying Ron DeSantis after Trump is like the next savior. And if you look what he says, it's a lot of us is the same populist rhetoric and but also culture war stuff. I think they've really latched on to like that's I think it's like for them, the opportunity came with the pandemic, with the mass mandates, with the vaccinations. Like they're like, yeah, this is our, our chance to once again be like um personal freedom you know from yeah. authoritarianism yeah and i think i think we've seen as well that sort of like the evangelical driven sort of social agenda is also still very dominant you know things like uh abortion are not going away that's still going to be very much front and center of, of what the republican party is all about and it is still going to be a party that is 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 very i think overtly culturally christian even in a way that i don't think it was in, in even in reagan's time so i would dispute the idea that uh yeah like that the party is adrift i think that it's it's going to be you know somewhat sort of pseudo libertarian on economic issues sort of evangelical on on uh, social issues and then i think sort of populist in terms of how it sort of messages and markets itself i think that all of those issues are pretty much resolved as far as the future of the gop goes yeah yeah that's a good point um yeah, uh, Emperor Tiger Star. He's by the way. He's I don't know. He probably doesn't mind me saying this, but he's from Missouri, and so oh, nice. Like, uh, probably, yeah. Like uh, the technology aspect of it, I didn't really connect that. All, my my school, my public schools growing up actually weren't the most wealthy either. I, I actually had we were behind the curve too. So that's that's an important thing to bring up. All right, my second question for you. <laughs> All right. Um. So. All right. I, yeah, this is a heavier question. And it's that's really, fine. OK, um, I've noticed this thing about Quebec with you. And I like yeah. and the more I find out about it, like you're one of the nicest YouTubers around. You're one of the nicest guys I've ever met for crying out loud. Oh, thank and you. so when I see some of this hate and a lot of it is is from Quebec, like a lot of your most co controversial videos are dealing with Quebec, um, you know, do you think any of that is fair or do you, do you have any regrets or are, is this just one of those things where it's just like the mob is out of control and like, you don't know what to think of it? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's a complicated issue. And I mean, like, this is a very sort of 
insular, esoteric kind of Canadian issue that is kind of perhaps difficult for people on the outside to fully grasp. You know, it kind of has to do with this idea that the French Canadians and the French Canadian people really do understand themselves to be the great victims of Canadian history, like the first victims uh, like the sort of in, in some ways, like their plight is kind of the original sin of the country, even more so than the, the plight of the Aboriginal people of this. I was going to say First Nations. <laughs> yeah. So like even more than that. And there's actually even some some tension there, which is a whole other sort of thing. And I do think that, you know, there is still to this day a real, real sort of sensitivity um, to people that criticize Quebec as sort of the manifestation of the French Canadian culture. I mean, they're going to change the constitution now to explicitly say that Quebec is the nation of the French Canadian people. Right. And I think that this, like, it's a very defensive project that the French Canadians have been engaged in for quite some time to build Quebec in their own image. And I think that there is a great deal of, of resistance, sensitivity, as I said, to people that seem insufficiently appreciative of that project, as I would say that I often come off as being. And that's because like, I am somebody that believes very much in individual rights. Like I suppose I'm a very sort of Anglo American kind of person in that sort of way, in that I believe primarily in the idea of, of individual rights as being the most supreme good. And that we, you know, I have sympathy for the Anglo American you know, ideal, which I think this country, Canada, was founded in the image of, of, of individual rights and individual rights protections. I think that a lot of the French Canadians uh, believe in the idea of collective rights and collective rights take precedent over individual rights. And I think if we're going to sort of just get deep and philosophical about this, I think that a lot of the controversy that I stir up with the Quebecers is that I just do not subscribe to their same value system on, in this way because mm. I don't believe deeply that the French Canadians have a collective right to, uh, you know, better their culture, to protect their culture that supersedes individual rights. And because I called that out and I criticized that in the many ways that it manifests, you know, most recently in the most recent uh, Canadian election, you know, there was some controversy about you know, the Quebec government and this sort of like very, I think, heavy handed law to prevent, you know, the Muslim women from wearing the headscarves and the Sikh men from wearing the turbans and stuff when they're interacting with the with the government or when they're pursuing government jobs. You know, to me, that's a very classic example of a very dramatic and I think quite offensive infringement on the individual rights of the Quebec people to sort of practice their faith as they see as they see right. And you know, a lot of the Quebec majority, all available polls suggest that the Quebec majority, the French Canadian majority, very much believes that that is an acceptable price to pay for the maintenance of the collective rights, the collective good of preserving and strengthening the French Canadian culture in what they see as a very sort of, they see themselves to be a sort of embattled minority that needs maximum protection to ensure their cultural survival. There was a poll that was just out today and it shows that, you know, whenever Quebecers are asked this question, they view their culture as being extremely delicate. You know, the French language, the survival of the French culture on this continent is sort of hanging by a thread and thus very, you know, what I would think of as heavy handed measures to protect it are justified. And, and that's just like, you know, uh, we're just on two very different pages as far as that goes. And I think, you know, if I can just bring this to a close, I do think that a lot of Anglo Canadians, English Canadians, are a little bit more hesitant than I am to sort of call out that conflict of values. I think there is much more of a sense in this country and certainly on the part of the, the government um, to just kind of let Quebec have its way and to just sort of like compartmentalize and say, this is a special part of Canada. The rules that apply everywhere else don't apply here. And that's why they're now supporting changing the constitution to make, to make uh, you know, what's previously just been implied explicit to sort of say that Quebec will be a society in which collective rights supersede individual rights. And that's just something I will never fully accept. So there will always be tension there. Yeah. Um, Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So, yeah, I had just wondering, like, I noticed, I got a little bit of this when my Maine and Louisiana video a few weeks ago. I, um, I you know, I went through the, the brief history of the Acadians and, um, I probably worded something poorly or I triggered some 
um, like modern day Acadians that lived up in uh, either Nova Scotia or Maine or whatever. And I, I know it's a touchy subject because, you know, when the French language and culture is dying in that part, especially Quebec, it seems to be more intact. Like um, we, it was funny because before we were talking about, uh, was this on camera or on air or to the tradition thing? Was that when we were live? <laughs> Uh, we were talking about traditions earlier, whether it was before yes. or after. Um, but so, it, it you know, it's it's a hard balance because um, we know how important identity is to people and what more than our traditions, uh, our culture, our religion, our language, all these things that are passed down, our customs. Uh, if you don't have that, what do you have? And so I understand the backlash um, and you're an easy target because you're one of the few, like you said, that are. Um, kind of just saying, hey, hold on, we don't have to go to this extreme. And yeah, I mean, I guess it's I guess like the thing is that I insist on judging Quebecers as Canadians, right? Mm. And that's not to sort of say that I'm some great opponent of the Quebec nationalist movement. You know, I think it's very much for the Quebec people to decide. But I do think that like, as long as Quebecers are Canadians, that, you know, we're all living under the same laws, we live under the same constitution, the constitution has not yet been changed to grant collective rights to the French Canadians. And until that day comes, you know, I will still sort of enforce, I think, a kind of common standard of, of liberty and a defense for, for individual rights that I think is the inheritance of every Canadian citizen, regardless of what province they live in, regardless if they're, you know, whatever religion they have, whatever race they have, like these are values that I think matter a great deal. And I think that the people in Quebec are Canadians and they are subject to the same, you know, legal system as the rest of us. And I think they have to be judged by the same standards. And when their government passes laws that in my mind are infringement on on the liberty of, of other Quebecers or of, of mm. Canadians more broadly, when we talk about some of the language policies and things, you know, I'm going to be defensive about that and I'm going to argue against it. Well, you see the unintended consequences, I think, and they don't maybe, uh, I put this up here. I don't know of any <laughs> Mexican equivalents of us, mostly because I think there's the language barrier there. Like yeah. I don't watch Spanish. I don't follow Spanish YouTube a whole lot. But I mean, like it's it's. I, I'd like to see it though, because you know, there's. Have you ever seen uh, Roman? Is his name the friendly neighborhood Russian? Uh, he has no. a different. He he he's very much like us, and like he makes videos about Russia, Russian politics, Russian government, Russian culture. Um, but he does it all in English, right? And I think that that's very useful because it allows him to sort <laughs> yeah. of have a much broader audience. I'm sure there's lots of channels like that, that that talk about Mexican stuff, but they would do it in Spanish for a primarily Spanish-speaking audience, and that's fair. I mean, there's a ton of Spanish people, Spanish-speaking people, not only in the U.S. but all over in the world. So you know, I guess maybe they just make the calculus of what uh, market is more compelling. Yeah. Well, as long as they speak my language, then I like. Wow. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying though. It's uh, yeah. thanks for all these nice comments uh, and, and super chats. Uh, yeah, that's just basically really kind words. Thank you, Patriot Raven. Yes. There's another all one. Right. Go ahead with your second question. Yeah, let me ask you a, a, a sort of more uh, lighter question, Matthew. Um, what have you learned from being in a band? Oh, well, I've been. Technically, I've been in three bands, like okay. uh, not including high school band. Um, and so like the current band that's been around since basically 2005, it's just my brother and I mostly. So I don't know if that really counts too much because my brother and I, I mean, we've had lots of practice, like, you know, dealing, we're a year and a half apart and um, we kind of read each other's minds a lot of times. And we kind of got most of our fighting out of the way when we were kids. <laughs> But yeah, like, uh, I think I've learned a lot. I mean, the thing about being in a band is that it's it's such a unique experience because not only do you have to get along as human beings, like you have to, a lot of times it's different personalities, like that a lot of times the only thing you have in common is the music. Um, but then like literally when you're playing songs on stage or recording, you have to be completely in tune with each other as well. So there's like, it's like, I understand how there's a special connection like with bandmates, like um, even I, like there was a, a 
shout out to Brian. He used to play with us in, uh, when we were in Omaha. He was only with us for like a year or two, but I feel like there's always this connection to him. Like when we had, when we, we jammed and we had played shows for a while and then, you know, uh, we've had different people join us o- over the years. And I feel like there's a kind of a special connection because um, you kind of like, I don't want to get sound all like, um, you know, no, that's fair. I mean, it's, it's like interesting to me because like, I'm like, it's, no, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. But there's, yeah, there's a special connection. I guess I'll leave it at that. That's so. really interesting. Cause like, this is, this is just like a realm of life. Cause I'm not musical in the slightest. I've never played any instruments, never been in any bands, but you know, a lot of people are in bands and it's, it's, uh, and because that's something I know about you, I was just sort of curious as to uh, sort of what impact it had on you. And, and that's, that's interesting. The interpersonal dynamics, I think, is something that I never thought of it, but that makes a lot of sense that that would be a very, a very sort of helpful life skill that you would gain from having to deal with uh, different people on a single project, you know? Well, yeah, because also like, you know, think about it. If one person is even slightly off, it ruins the whole thing. And it's a lot of times if you have a team working on something, there can be people slacking and there can be people that kind of are just hidden uh, whereas in the band, you kind of all have to be, unless the lead guitarist just decides to turn his, turn it up to 11 and, and like drown everybody else out. <laughs> I was in a band. That's interesting. Lead guitar. Actually, I was in a band where in college where there was three songwriters. I was one of the songwriters. And so we had a similar situation to like the Beatles where you have, you know, egos coming to play. Like, let's play more. I wrote this song. And that's better than your song. You know, we're going to play this one, but you have to yeah. compromise. And <laughs> uh, oh, oh, okay. I'll look into that. Thanks for bringing that to our attention, Mason. Have you? Section two thirty public. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, I see your point. Yeah, like making in in Canada. Do they have? Um, like who moderates the big debates, like the national um, debates that it's 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 well, there is like a media consortium uh, debate uh, organizing entity as there is in, in the US. So and the people that uh, ask the questions are sort of like mainstream uh, media journalists. Yeah, it's but quite, the, uh, quite the parade of journalists in this most recent debate. But who organizes the, the debates in the United States for the last 30 years is the the democratic and republican parties like it they they literally are the ones who control it like uh, it used to be the league of women voters and the debates were so much uh better back then if you go back and watch the the you know from the 80s of course they're more boring i guess but, <laughs> but it's still it's still moderated by mainstream american journalists right like they, was, they the yeah. the because like the parties like I guess I guess what makes it a bit different is that the the parties sort of like negotiate the terms I think a little bit more in in America than yeah. they although oh, yeah. like this 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 whole thing is is rather new in Canada the idea of having a, a sort of debate commission traditionally it's just been like the media outlets just come up with their own standards and you can kind of take it or leave it and sometimes politicians just choose not to participate in in media debates if they don't like the terms whereas in right. America and I guess increasingly in in Canada you're kind of trying to come up with like some sort of objective criteria of who gets in and who doesn't get in and what the format is going to be and that kind of thing but yeah no it's a uh, sorry for all these questions but people are very to the death of pseudo history like the lost cosmic Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, we're already seeing that with like, there's been so much attack in, in the history YouTuber um, communities lately of uh, on ancient aliens. Yes. I've already noticed a shift there. Like, I mean, th- what's interesting also is to me is the, you know, YouTube gave us like the rise of flat earth conspiracies. And then at the same time, YouTube kind of cut down on that. And then now th- there was also like, backlash as well like a reaction to that so i don't know a lot of that stuff i think sad to say is top down youtube youtube does control the algorithms you know a lot of you haven't been seeing my videos lately by the way Uh (laughs) i don't know like i i I sometimes i i'm I'm maybe a little bit less optimistic than 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 this guy thomas uh is because (laughs) i i often kind of feel like that 
as much as there is like certainly a golden age of debunking and all of this kind of thing on YouTube, I do kind of feel like that a lot of young people are introduced to ideas that previously had sort of been dead and buried through YouTube and through the internet more broadly. And because they like I think that, them because they like them because it's like rebellious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's novel and exciting. Like you see all of this like stuff about like, you know, real crackpot political ideologies and conspiracy theories and stuff getting sort of a new second life because I think to young people it, it seems rebellious or it seems novel or it just kind of seems like interesting in the same way that like there's so many like videos about ghosts and monsters and things that are targeted to young people because they kind of get a thrill out of it and I think that like you know quote unquote edgy or revisionist political or historical stuff I think appeals to young people in a, in a kind of similar way so I don't I know if uh, I I don't get it though. Like if you want to be edgy and rebellious as a teen, you go toward the people in power. And mm. a lot of times it's very similar to like a schoolyard where instead of all ganging up, ganging up on the bully, you like gang up on each other. Cause it's easier. Cause if you go yeah. after the bully, there's a chance you may, you'll get the crap beat out of you. <laughs> so I think we need, if you really want to be edgy kids, attack people in power. Um, Dante. Wow. Thanks for the support again. Uh, he brought up here the demographics for the Republican Party. Um, you know, <laughs> the way does this excruciate? Is that, is that a good analogy, Matthew? Like, I, I don't know enough about this, but he's sort of saying, like, he's drawing an analogy between the Whigs. Is that yeah. is that what killed the Whigs? Because I thought that, I mean, I don't know a lot about this, but, like, was demographic decline a significant factor in the decline of the Whigs? Oh, I think Dante's point is just that they died. Like, yeah. Um, the Whig Party declined mostly because of splintering and on the on the issue of slavery in particular. There were some people that were just so passionate about ending slavery, they couldn't even negotiate within the party anymore. And they also noticed that, hey, there's some Democrats that might we can get on our side, too. Let's go form the Republican Party. So, but I think with the, the current GOP, I do think he has a point that the demographic, I mean, like most Republicans tend to, I, I would, I would guess the median age of Republicans is as much older than the median age of Democrats. It's been that way for a while. However, um, something that was unique that, you know, 2016, I think was really revealing because we can't deny that, that Donald Trump brought a lot of young people into the party that otherwise wouldn't have. And he also converted like, like my aunt into the party who was always independent, you know, so, like, if you have a charismatic enough person, that changes everything. I think the Democrats' problem has been for many years now, like since Barack Obama in 2008, they haven't had that transformative figure. The closest they've had is AOC, but she gets attacked so much. Um, I don't think she she stands a chance if she ever runs for president. I mean, I don't know. That could change in a few years. But right now, like, she's like the the number one target from conservative media anyway what i'm talking too much any thoughts <laughs> i mean people people do get older i mean people do get more conservative as, as they get older as well right so like well, that's I've always seen studies, i've seen conflicting studies on that i used to think that and then I was yeah. like, i've seen studies that um said actually people get more left-leaning um or whatever you want to call it i don't even know if that's yeah. the right way to put it maybe more tolerant yeah. Uh, like prime example is my parents. Like um, they, you know, the death penalty, they used to be a death penalty. And now they're yes. like, oh, no, yeah. So I don't know. Like that's an anecdote, by the way. Yeah, but yeah, no, there have been studies on this. So I think it's more complex than that. But what, what was mm -hmm. your what was your larger point? No, I mean, I guess that, that was really it. <laughs> I mean, oh, I, okay. I, 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 but I agree with you. Like there and certainly like there are signs that that the Republicans under Trump, you know, made some mild headway with uh, Latino men and black yep. men. Like that's sort of significant as well. Like I think that as, as sort of politics becomes kind of more uh, divided on the basis of gender, like that there's still probably some sorting that has yet to sort of fully sort out, you know, that sort of more men might sort of be starting to drift uh, Republican and then, you know, more women drift Democrat, like, you know, that there's kind of, I don't know, like, it, it, it definitely feels like the party system, or at least the, the party identification of the American people is still like that all of the sort of sand hasn't quite settled on that yet. 
So I wouldn't I wouldn't be too premature in sort of saying that the Republicans have no viability uh, because of demographic change, because I think that there is still some some uh, some mild uh, stuff going on there that we have yet to sort of see the, the final stage of. So and even then, it doesn't matter because gerrymandering is so bad and voting suppression is a real thing in the United States that even a minority party can still stay in power, um, majority power. We're probably going to see that next yeah. year at the midterms that I think Republicans will probably make gains. And it's mostly because of gerrymandering and voter suppression, not voter suppression as much. I think that's a little overstated, but I do think it's, it is a real thing. Some people deny that it exists at all. And I, I just, well, I think, I think the Senate as well is also just works in the advantage of the, of the Republicans, right? Like just that Democrat, I mean, Democrats are so concentrated in a handful of, of city, a uh, handful of states, and within those states, a handful of cities that, you know, the American system is not really based on, on a po- representation by population basis so much as it is equal representation for the regions in terms of the Senate and the uh, Electoral College. So, I, yeah, I agree. Why don't um, do you want to ask me the, my next, your next question for me, Matthew? We have, yeah, uh, uh, we're going to, we're going to take hold off on questions because we got to get through our own questions here. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate the. It's my turn, right? It is your turn. Yes, I've asked okay. you already. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, you went. This is a lighthearted question. You went okay. back and forth with the mustache. You're back with the yes. mustache now. Uh, I just want to say, over the years, that what guides your decision to grow out the stash? <laughs> it's funny. I mean, like, oh God, I'm trying to remember now. Like when, because like for a long time, I never had facial hair. It was like really only in my last year of college that I did it. And it was because like, I was just, I don't know, I was kind of feeling like depressed at one phase of my life. And I just kind of like wasn't shaving. And then I was just kind of like, oh, maybe I should just try doing the mustache. And so I just shaved everything off except for that. And then like, this was sort of in the, you know, I guess mid 2000s in which there was the kind of the great hipster revival and having (laughs) mustaches was considered like briefly a sort of fashionable thing along with the skinny jeans and all of that. Uh, So that was sort of like the first phase. But then as like time went on, like, you know, hipsterism became a subject of increasing scorn. And I didn't really like the idea of being the mustache guy. And like that being the thing that everybody would sort of see and think about me whenever they would sort of see me, because I would feel the same way when I'd be at some coffee shop and the barista would have a mustache. It's like, Oh yeah, this guy, you know? So I didn't want people to be judging me that way. So then I shaved it off for several years, but I don't know, like, I guess as I'm getting older, like I kind of feel like perhaps mustache helps cover up some of the signs of, of decay, <laughs> you know? So All right, I'm growing a mustache. Screw it. I'm weird again. I don't know. I mean, like, but now I'm getting so much gray hair and I'm even getting gray hair in my mustache. So like, maybe it's not a great look either. I don't know. I like playing with my look and I, I, I'm still trying to find out the one that works best for me. So it's also fun just to mess with the audience. Like, I think so. randomly. Yeah. Like they, they, I, I did no shade in November a couple of years ago and my beard was crappy, but the fact that I even had one, people were like, Oh yeah, I keep it. They're all excited. Like, I don't know if I'll ever do that again. Honestly. <laughs> do you ever, do you ever, here's a, here's an appearance question for you, Matthew. Do you ever think about switching your glasses? You have these very thick framed glasses. Has that always been your, your look? Well, little did you know, or the audience didn't know, no one commented on this. I just got new glasses like a couple weeks ago. Oh, is that so? But they're very similar, yes. Like I, you know, I like this style and Weezer is my second favorite band of all time. Shout out oh, to yes. Cuomo, uh, I think who's the greatest songwriter of Gen X. Uh, but yeah, I just like them and they're different. That's the main thing. I don't like that. This, whatever's in style, I tend to go a little bit of, and I like the fact that I, I wear cargo shorts around and people are yeah. like, you know, like making fun of me because I don't want to be too stylish. Mrs. Beat is always trying to get me in style. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so like she's like, put your, because I had my hair up uh, like in February for a live stream and yeah. everyone's like, yeah, keep it like that. I'm like, because you're saying that, I'm not going to. Uh-huh. That's how I am. That's how ridiculous I am. Uh, so yeah, just tell me to keep my hair straight like this and I'll style it. <laughs> I like that. All right, Matthew, let me ask you a question now. Tell me, Matthew, what is the most overrated event in American history? Ooh. Okay, I, I have to think. Uh, 
Overrated. Overrated is a is a fun is a fun thing to ask. If you've ever listened to uh, to Tyler Cohen's uh, podcast, which I'm quite fond of, he always okay. asks his guests to name. He he throws out things at his guests, and he always says underrated or overrated. So I, I'd be curious to know as someone who's because like there's so much of American history that's so sentimentalized and glamorized and all the rest of it. There there must be like some event that you kind of think gets way more time than it really deserves see it'd be a lot easier to answer the this is underrated because i'd always you know oh the yeah, korean it, War. everybody's everybody's got underrated things matthew that's yeah, an easy thing yeah. to answer it's hard to sort of name something that other people like or that other people sort of celebrate but you think is a little bit uh you know well over the two things pop in my head i don't know if this is right i probably have to think more on this but the first two things is the roaring 20s like i, yeah. I think that it's it, like people just assume that actually they see these flappers dancing in the, uh, you know, up on the balcony. Yeah. That, that's how it was. I'm like, no, like we, we, re we like to remember certain parts of it, but the majority, like, I mean, at the same time you had farmers that were basically, you know, scraping by to survive, you know, across the country. And so I always say roaring twenties, like, you know, like, eh, and it wasn't even that influential. Like the, the true change for like, as far as uh, like liberal reforms for um, civil liberties, that was like the 60s and 70s, like birth control, man. Hardly anyone yeah. was still on birth control in the 1920s. So anyway. you can even say you could even say like culturally, like how much of that music from the 1920s is sort of still looming large in the American consciousness today. Right. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, I, I know we wouldn't have rock and roll if it weren't for jazz and jazz. That was the jazz age of the time. That's fair. At the same time. Yeah. Like rock and roll that was where it really got real i mean listen to any song from the early 60s and compared to the early 70s and like what the heck happened in those 10 years holy crap yeah. so but i mean uh the other thing that comes to mind maybe i'll get in trouble for saying this is world war ii and i think the reason why i say this is because the freaking history channel you know like yeah they, they either do the ancient aliens or the ice road truckers or pawn stars crap and then, but if they do it, decide to focus on history, it's going to be World War II. It's always World War II. Hitler this, you know, Stalin that. Uh, oh, like, let's have a five-hour series, <laughs> mini-series on the Battle of the Bulge. Like, I don't care about the Battle yeah. of the Bulge that much. And so, and even you see this on YouTube. I mean, the, if you have a, a World War II and World War I both have youtube channels that they have yes world war one I, I think is more interesting than world war ii just literally more interesting um so yeah sorry sorry world war ii lovers <laughs> No, it's it's it's. Uh, I think my favorite sort of theory about all this, and I referenced this in one of the videos that I, I I made a while ago, which is this idea. There's this historian Matthew White who has the what he calls the theory of like the hemoclism, which is that. the idea. Yeah, which is basically the idea that like World War One was for all intents and purposes like the beginning of a long period of war that sort of encompassed the world lasting up and even beyond 1945. And so, in some respects, like understanding. World War One is more important geopolitically from a historian sort of perspective than the Second World War, which is largely just, you know, I mean, everything about the start of the Second World War is impossible to be understood without understanding the beginning of the First World War and then the, you know, the war itself. Right. So. Yeah, I think I think it, I think it's I think it's fair to kind of say that World War Two in isolation is perhaps an, uh, a bit overrated. Yeah, that's a good way to put it in isolation. I, I do think that we, we should always connect it with World War One. It's basically just one long war with a brief interruption, like even, you know, the, looking at the years before World War One, like really the first half of the entire 20th century is just it's a big chapter in a book and it's an important chapter, probably the most important chapter over the last 500 years. But I, um, yeah, anyway, let's go on. Let's move on. Here. Number four. Uh, okay. So this is, I leave this short and sweet and open-ended on purpose. I don't, I don't know where you're going to go with this question, but who are your biggest influences or you could say who were your biggest influences, but yeah, who are your biggest, biggest influences? <sighs> My biggest influences, man, that is a very, that is a very good question. Um, <laughs> ah, geez, Louise. I mean, it's, it's hard because like I've done so many different things in my life, you know, like there's, 
like for a long time, I, I used to sort of think of myself as being a cartoonist, right? And so like I had some great sort of cartoon cartoonist heroes that were very insp inspirational to me because, you know, I really looked up to their their artistry, like, you know, the cartoonist Al Hirschfeld, who was sort of one of the great American cartoonists of the 20th century. Like he was somebody that I really admired. I, you can see the picture of uh, Here, let me, uh... Mario behind me. I don't oh. know how to point properly. Like I, I loved I loved uh, the guy who made Mario, uh, Shirogito Miyamoto. Like What's he was a great- again? Shirogito Miyamoto. Okay. Do you know him? Or are no, you thinking about you that? I was going to show some of these pictures. Oh, you mean the, the cartoonist? Yeah, the cartoonist. Oh, Al Hirschfeld. It's A L H I C R C H or H I C R. If you just punch it in. Yeah, there you go. No. Al Hirschfeld. No, that's, that's Al Hirschfeld. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I recognize this. Yeah, it's very, very iconic style he had. He was he was really a fantastic uh, uh, cartoonist in the way that he was able to capture people's likenesses with a bare minimum of lines. You know, I mean, he was just really one of the great American artists, and and you know, a real student of personality as well. Like he understood, and he he you know he was very eloquent and very articulate about this as well. Like that he he understood that we all go through life, um, you know, trying to be someone, trying to be a character, like as much as actors. And, you know, he spent so much of his time drawing the various stars of Broadway and he would try to draw not the actor, not the physicality of the actor, but the physicality of the actor embodying the role, embodying the character that the actor was trying to portray, if that makes sense. But then as well, like he would sort of say that we're all actors in our own way. Like, you know, we all affect our, our hair, our clothes, our gait, you know, our mannerisms. We're all, whether consciously or not, trying to create a character, a character that is JJ, a character that is Mr. Beat, right? Like, and so Hirschfeld just kind of had such a savvy understanding of that. And I think it was just i don't know he was just a very very insightful man who had a lot of meaning behind the art that he created and i always just really admired that about him i admired reading his thoughts as much as i enjoyed looking at his his artwork um okay <laughs> and then i was sort of saying that uh Miyamoto, the guy that made mario was a huge inspiration to me as well just because i thought that he was just a man of just endless imagination and creativity and still is to this day um <laughs> looking about Miyamoto. Yeah, see, there's the guy right there. You can see with the long hair in the middle. <clears throat> yeah, that's him. Okay. He, I mean, because, you know, he was a product of, of a very sort of conformist society that does not often, you know, I've spent time in Japan and Japan is not, certainly Japan in sort of the, the post-war era that he grew up in was not a sort of society that valued like bold creative ideas, you know, bold, uh, mm. Re sort of like he very much reimagined the the concept of what a video game could be. You know, he created Mario. He created a video game that had characters, that had life, that had personality, that had sort of a, a brand new original setting of a sort of fantasy world instead of just being a world of you know shooting you know uh, you know spaceships shooting <laughs> aliens or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And 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 just the amount of energy and creativity and, and dynamism that he brought to the world of, of video games and all the creative characters and people that, you know, we see this now, you know, Yoshi and Mario and Luigi and Bowser, like, you know, to contribute to sort of these characters of such great sort of cultural staying power. I, in my mind, he's a man that's like, you know, up there with, with somebody like Walt Disney or Charles Schultz or any of the other sort of like great figures of, of the culture that have created sort of lasting universes and worlds and, and characters that have withstood the test of time. And one, one other person I'll give you an example of actually that, uh, is is and this is an unusual one is is roger ebert you know the film critic oh yes like he if i think about people that inspired me as a writer i really kind of have to go back to him because he was just you know he did nothing but watch movies for a living and yet he could always write like 750 words about a film that made you think about topics bigger than just the film itself mm. you know he just had such a way with words he had great sort of fun with the stylistic exercise of writing a column. You know, I write a column now and I, I still like, I appreciate what it would have been like to have been writing columns on a single topic, like not even something as dynamic as politics, but you know, the man wrote multiple columns every week 
on a topic like movies for 40 years. And yet he was always fresh. He was always interesting. He could do clever literary things in addition to sort of sharing important cultural, political, you know, social, artistic insights. So he was yeah. just I, like, this is, I think the sort of person that I want to be when I sort of give these sort of three examples of these three men is, you know, I want to be somebody that, that contributes to the culture in the way that, that, that they did. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, it's a complete surprise. That honestly, like, that's cool. <laughs> I mean, I feel like I should I should ask you that same question, Matthew. I mean, that's <laughs> well. That's, but, uh, uh, it's hard to, for me to be brief. Um, but yeah, like. Well, I wasn't I, brief, so I mean, you should you can be as, just as long winded <laughs> as you want. I, I like to think. I mean, I can say the tacky teacher answer, which is uh, my students. Um, over the years, and they really have had a huge impact on me. And uh, the, you watching this video, all the people watching, um, that's a the recent example. When I like for YouTube specifically, um, when I decided, hey, maybe I want to start making educational videos. Um, I think the big three that kind of stood out to me uh, were um, CG, CGP Gray, um, Derek from Veritasium and tom scott and uh oh yes they like those are they i still continue to aspire to be um like them even to this day like even though i've kind of found my own style um before that you know like i had other interests so i when i was a kid i used to be i used to write comic strips i was oh, yeah. a big garfield fan jim davis was was my uh, gary larson the far side oh yeah um, he's great yeah uh, and as far as like, um, you know, I think not just people, but, um, MTV was very influential to me. Uh, that's very, even, very even though, I didn't, you, even though I didn't get to watch it much growing up in the Simpsons, like I know the Simpsons is, was very influential yeah. with you. Um, you know, I, I had great parents growing up too, or if you want to talk about it, we always, forget our, our parents, how, inf how much they influence us. And it's funny. Cause like, uh, I think my mom and dad would say that, you know, you turned out like, I don't even know how, why you turned out the way you did. Cause I feel like, you know, uh, I, there's no way I could have predicted this basically. It's not anything bad, but then you think about it, like, you know, a big reason why you are who you are is like who you spend your time with most of your life. And that's yeah, like, uh, your family growing up, but also your, your best friends in middle school and high school. Like I think about if I were, if I stayed in Catholic grade school versus going to public school in middle school, like that was a, I never would have met all these new friends that were totally, they opened up my eyes. So yeah, I can get really deep on, on this question because I think about that all the time, you know, like it's the whole thing where, um, I know free will maybe doesn't exist. Okay, I get it. But <laughs> like, once you go down that path, like, whoa, like it's sometimes sometimes that path can, like you're influenced by things that um, can really be magnets too. And that you don't realize it until much later sometimes. Like the whole reason why I went this down this path was this this one person or this one show that I used to watch, you know. In what, in what way, I'm curious, Matthew, in what way are you like your parents, would you say? Because I definitely feel that way as a lot as well. Like, I, as certainly as I get older, too, I, I realize how much I'm like my parents and how much sort of just the way I go about the world and my assumptions and and sort of just my my general, even like to, towards things like, like learning. Like, for example, I'll give you an example. Like, you know, my father traveled a lot when he was young and, and my father very much values like knowing a little bit about everything, right? Like, you can bring up almost anything to my dad and he'll have something to say about that. Like any country in the world, like he has like one anecdote about things that go on there. And I've always kind of aspired to that myself. Like I would like to know a little bit about everything. I'd like to be able to sort of, in the same way my father can, I'd like to be able to sort of like fake my way through a conversation about just about any subject under the sun. So like, that's a way that I become very conscious that like I'm, you know, I don't think I, I consciously did that, but now I'm becoming very conscious of it. So is there a sort of thing like that where you can say to say that like in some very visible way that you're becoming like your one of your parents? Yeah, I'm like my my mom is she always has to be doing something and I get that from her like I I can't just sit around and do nothing like I um <laughs> so like work ethic I think mostly from her um as far as my dad like 
Um, he likes to tinker and build. Um, and I think most of that went to my brother, but at the same time, like his passion for things, like when he gets into it, he like really gets into it. I think that come kind of come from, I get that from him. Um, you know, it, it's, are, are they interested in, in history the way you are? Um, my dad is mostly interested just in a very, like, he likes, uh, the old West, like, uh, you know, uh, 1800s American West history. That's his big thing, but not really most of history. No. And my mom, no, like, and it's funny too. Cause like, uh, they were not really that musical or they didn't draw much. Uh, my mom does play the dulcimer, but like all three of us kids, my, myself and my siblings all like played instruments and you know my brother and I like I said earlier in a band together it's like it's weird how certain things kind of like you get it from different parts of your family as well so neither of them were teachers nope no. interesting I, I find that I, do you find that that a lot of teachers are children of other teachers oh yeah and yeah. a lot of times they're the best ones like like I uh my colleagues over the years that had parents as teachers, I'm like, that explains it. Cause like, it's almost like in your DNA, like how you just know certain things that, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. Uh, uh, I, it's, it? I, can't remember. I think it's, I think it's my, uh, I think it's my turn. Oh, you, okay. Here on me. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you actually sort of talking about travel and all of that. Have you ever gone to a historic site that was particularly moving? to you in an emotional way? Um, yeah, yeah, like um, I think, uh, well, I mean, pretty much any time I visit a historical site, I like, I think that I it's, it's a powerful experience for me just because like I always, especially if there's something violent, like a, a side of where people died, like um, I just, I, I think about, uh, you know, the worst possible thing that can happen. Like I've never been to Europe and I, I'm sure the dynamic is even more over there because it's, uh, but you know, even civil war battle sites in the United States, you kind of get this feel like Gettysburg. I've never been to, but I've heard this about, about there. Like, it's just, uh, there's like this weight in the air and like, it kind of forces you to think, and maybe it's just the fact that you're thinking it's all psychosomatic, whatever, but you, I don't know. Like when you know something horrible happened someplace, um, I've I've had like just dread. Like, and I don't believe in ghosts, okay, but um, maybe I can understand why people do. <laughs> you know, I've been to places where you know they do those haunted uh, tours. You know, like this person was murdered right there, and you know it's fun to like think about like oh, but at the same time, like oh god, like that happened. And like it just makes you more grateful too at the same time. So there's not one place in particular. You have any particular place that stands out for you? Like or we're throwing our we questions be, back at each other. We shouldn't we shouldn't get in the habit of doing this, Matthew, because we have so many, so many questions yeah. yet to get through. But I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I you know, I was in Israel a few years ago, and I mean this is a very sort of cliche thing to say, but you know, I went to the the Holocaust Museum there, and it is an incredible, incredible museum. And uh, there's a there's a moment at the end where they have like this huge sort of uh, gallery of all of these uh, binders of the names where all of the people died. And that is a very, very striking thing to see. And they specifically have it right at the very end of the of the tour. So it, it sort of has a maximum. And actually, when I was in Chile a few years ago, I went to a, a rather similar thing where they have a museum of human rights, uh, the people that died under the Augusto Pinochet uh, dictatorship. And at the, at the I forget if it's at the end or the beginning, but they have this like huge mural of just individual photographs of the thousands of people that were killed during that time. And that was like a very, very sort of striking thing to see. I mean, these things are designed to be emotionally affecting through the architecture and all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, quite emotionally moving chills, yeah. you know. I drew re really quickly, I wanna give a shout out to the Oklahoma City uh, bombing museum in Oklahoma City. That is, that will get you your emotions going. That, that, that stands out. If you ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. Mm. Uh, okay, number five. Ooh, I forgot I wrote this one down. What was the scariest moment of your life? <laughs> the scariest moment of my life. All right. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you can see it, but like I have a scar right here. 
And that was because oh, when I was, can you see that? Uh, yeah, see if I can you see can it. See the, yeah. yeah. So uh, when I was, when I was about 16 years old, uh, uh, this is, uh, I don't like this story, but when I was like 16 years old, I was, um, uh, the phone was ringing in the house and then I was running and my hand went through the window and like, uh, that was just so awful. There was so much blood and it was just so God awful. And that was just a very frightening, horrific experience. We had to, <laughs> we drove to one hospital and then like, you know, great Canadian medical system, the emergency room was too full. So we had to go to the other hospital way on the other side of town. And like, I had just this big rag wrapped around and there's just blood everywhere. Oh my God. It just makes me so queasy to even think about how awful that was. But like, uh, that was just like a just a terrifying like horrific situation I was in. I don't know if that that counts as as scary because like I feel like when you sort of say the scariest point of your life, you kind of imagine a phase in which your life was like in in danger and like you sort of feared for your life or you feared for the uncertainty of it. And so like when I cut my arm that way, like it was grotesque and terrifying in in a kind of like you know my heart and you know I'm going nuts because it's so scary but you know i guess on some level like i knew that the situation would be taken care of like you know i knew that we were eventually going to get into a hospital going to get eventually sort of seen by a doctor like so in terms of like a scenario i'm trying to think if there's ever been a situation where like i've just been like in a in a kind of more primal stage state of panic because like i just didn't know what was going to happen and I don't think I, I don't think I have. I think that I've been fortunate enough to always have been relatively safe in my life, and I've never really sort of felt like I've been uh, any any real severe danger, you know, knock on wood, or or anything to do with my my parents or or or, or anything like that. Yeah. So maybe an unsatisfying answer. No, that's good. That's it. <laughs> no wonder you're so happy. <laughs> Although right. I also figured out why you're conservative leaning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> dang Canadian government ran healthcare. Well. <laughs> Emergency room is full. <laughs> well, I mean, it's this it's not an illegitimate concern, you know. Like there uh, this is something that Canadians often complain about. I mean, right now with COVID as well, you know, like the Canadian hospitals do generally have very, very limited capacity. And guess that, what? They do in the United States too. Is that so? Well, yeah. My yeah, aunt, I know. my aunt had COVID in uh she no she was completely neglected they just left her out there in the emergency room and she ended up going to another hospital um yeah and then just walking into an ER, er in this country will cost you hundreds if not thousands of dollars even with insurance so i guess that's mm -hmm. my but yeah no that, that that's that's a big fear like that's like that shouldn't happen anywhere like yes you should be taken care of you should be able to go yeah that they need, has it gotten any better since you were a kid? Well, I mean, I, I just wrote it. ER lately. <laughs> I haven't been to the I haven't been to the ER lately. I mean, people certainly complain about ER backlogs as much as 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 ever. I mean, obviously with COVID, it's we're kind of in a bit of an unusual situation now. But you know, yeah, complaining about a lack of uh, a lack of access in emergency situations is is not a new complaint in Canada. So. I mean, I wrote a column for the Washington Post recently where I talked about, like, you know, <clears throat> the province of Alberta, you know, which is Canada's wealthiest province and the province that spends the most on the public health care system. You know, they have a emergency room or, or an ICU capacity, I should say, that is less than half of what Alabama has. You know, Alabama, one of America's poorest states, mm -hmm. has a higher ICU capacity than Alberta, one of the wealthiest states in Canada. So that, to me, is a bit of an indictment of, of the system. And it's in part because, you know, in, the, in this country, every, well, certainly in Alberta, all of the hospitals are, are run by the government. There is no, you know, in Alberta, in Alabama, you have a, a fairly more equal distribution between, you know, privately run hospitals, state run hospitals, and then sort of non-for-profit charitable run hospitals. And that's the kind of system that I would like to see in, in this country. Not uh, not that everything is fully private or everything is fully government, but no, you have I, some I agree. balance, you know. I, I don't think governments should be running much of anything, frankly. They're pretty bad at it, um, inefficiencies. and um, But I think uh, covering the check is fine. There, the one thing that governments sh seem to be at least halfway decent in, that is like paying people money. Like when we had stimulus checks go out here in the United States, this dang socialist government under the Trump administration, uh, <laughs> giving people money. 
Um, mm -hmm. But that was pretty efficient. Like it, people got their money pretty quickly. And I was like, oh. Um, so yeah, like I, I do agree that government running these things generally, we, we see, it doesn't even matter. It's not even exclusive to North America at all. Like you see it all over the world. Okay. Keep all it right. going. <laughs> okay. Here, here's a question for you, uh, Matthew. So what is a video you would like to make, but you know would be very unpopular? Oh, well, let me just open up my list. I'm not going to share this with the public, <laughs> but I'm going to open up my document here that you, your, your video list list is hundreds of, I have hundreds of ideas. It's no, no oh, joke. Yes. Um, yeah. Like, okay. Uh, let's see. Just, just kind of scrolling through here. A lot of these things would be, do pretty well, actually. I just don't have time to make all of them. Hold on, I just need to get a bottle of water. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a um, a fat like the, this one stands out to me. Like um, there was this dude named Bud Dwyer, um, and if y'all want to Google Bud Dwyer. Maybe someone else will make this video now. Here, I'll show it on the screen. That's not it. That's the other thing. Bud Dwyer was a guy who was a representative from Pennsylvania, state representative, who got on television and uh, he just committed suicide, shot himself in front of Oh, all yeah, people. yeah, yeah. And I was always fascinated by his story um, but I don't know how I, I would market it in a way where, like, what would I do for the thumbnail? I, I, I mean, obviously, it'd be demonetized and it'd be something that the algorithm would not favor and all this stuff. So it probably wouldn't even do that well. But I just think it's such a fascinating story, you know, like um, just kind of glancing at other stuff of this list here. Like a lot of times when I just want to do a straight up explainer video. I feel like those don't do as well either. Like, you know, um, terrorism, just explain what terrorism is and like the history of it. I feel like uh, maybe somebody in the comments right now, like saying, Mr. B, totally do that video. <laughs> you I really don't, you don't have a lot of aversion to walking towards controversial topics, do you? Like you, you, you really sort of like head on confront these kinds of things. Why do people hate the Jews? You know, what do you think of the Confederate flag? You know, what is terrorism? Yeah. You know, like these are things that you're not, you're not, you don't strike me as being super self-conscious about. And I, I don't say no. that like in, in an insulting way. I just think that that's, that's quite, that's quite novel. You can be critical. That's fine. And I, I probably should address that because I, I did, I did offend some people by making that video last week about those videos about the Confederate battle flag and the MAGA hat and going to the street and stuff. But um, part of the reason why I do it, let's be honest, is I want people to click on the video because otherwise they want it. And I'm constantly just trying to figure out new ways to trick people into learning. That's what I, as a teacher in the classroom, that's what I do. I, I There's no way they're going to care about this stuff. I got to trick them into caring about it. Mm -hmm. uh, most of you here watching right now, you care about this stuff anyway. So it's easy. Um, so with the algorithms, like a lot of times I'm trying to reach an audience who's never even heard of me, like who, Mr. Beast? No, Mr. Beat. And so that's one reason. The other reason is I think um, it shouldn't be taboo um, that we can't talk about certain things. Like I think uh, I'm very, if you've known me, I'm very anti-censorship. I think um, the more we make things taboo, like generally the, the more aggressive society is. Um, so like even something like the N word, I would never say the N word publicly or privately. It's a horrible thing to say, but at the same time, maybe a video about why that is, and maybe that would get me a lot of hate, but why on earth? Like what that's, you got to think critically. You can't just accept things. You got to know why you got to know how don't just know what. And so that mm -hmm. really is one of my things that I'm, I think is important that knowing the why and the how will help you think more critically about a lot of things. Um, and, and so don't just blindly accept things. And so I feel like uh, a lot of times like controversial things, like I just, it's, you know, religion and politics, right? The, like yeah. the two things you don't bring up at Thanksgiving dinner, 
maybe you should freaking bring them up. You know, I don't even care because that's how we're going to grow as a society. If you just stay in some ways, it's been horrifying to see the, the political discourse over the last few years. But in other ways, it's been promising because we've seen people sometimes escape out of their bubbles and interact that otherwise never, ever would have interacted with each other, um, especially before, you know, social media even existed. So anyway, I went on a rant there. Sorry. No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sensitive to it. I mean, like, I, I can understand that there's definitely... Uh... Sometimes there's valid reasons for things to be taboo, and sometimes there's valid reasons to be sort of be sensitive about sort of how one engages with with a sort of very fraught uh, topic. But at the same yeah. time, like I, I I do respect being able to sort of confront uh, sort of taboo topics head on. I think that's admirable. You know, I, I when I think about things that frustrate me about this country and and in Canada and sort of the political discourse here. I do often think that this is a country of far too many taboos, right? Like we were talking earlier about the situation with the French Canadians and like a lot of Canadians, even though they privately have a problem with it and they think that some of the things that the Quebec government is doing are wrong, they're just kind of like, well, this is a taboo and we shouldn't really sort of talk about that and, you know, just keep your head down and just don't rock the boat and this kind of thing. Whereas I think that like, the chaotic nature of American democracy, which you sort of rightly pointed out, is, I think, in some ways, a sort of a testament to the strength of American democracy. The fact that people can just debate anything, right, <laughs> under the sun. And, and I, you know, it, 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 I think at its best, it can force a certain kind of maturity on the part of the American public, right? It's like, this is a live issue that a lot of people really care about. So we're going to have a conversation about it, whether you like it or not. So you better make sure that your own thoughts are organized about this topic, because otherwise you're going to lose the debate. So mm -hmm. I think that's that's something that I, I think is a respectable part of any, of any democracy, while also sort of being sensitive to the needs of I think what's important as well is to be sensitive to the needs of those affected by the conversation to ensure that they have a place in the conversation itself. You know? Yes. Also, just how you approach it, you know, you try to do it in a respectful way. <laughs> you, yeah. you don't. Um, yeah, that was tough for me going on the street to, you know, because people, they automatically are, have assumptions and. Uh, did you talk to, uh, I haven't seen the videos, I, I, I must apologize. Uh, did you speak to many uh, black people? Um, only, only one or two, hmm. only one, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm an, I'm in an area that's unfortunately not very diverse <laughs> in Kansas, yeah. not as diverse probably as Vancouver, but, uh, but yeah, like, uh, I didn't know any of those people. Some people are like, well, you only pick people that hate Trump. I'm like, I, I didn't pick them. Most you didn't see what, what you didn't see is I got rejected by like 95% of the people. And it was really humiliating. Like, like, no, who was, who was like, doing like, who was doing the camera? Your wife, my friend, Dan. Oh. Uh, yeah. Who you, uh, you met him in Iowa. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, yeah. I've, I've often thought I'd like to do kind of man on the street stuff, but I, I am, I'm quite shy when it comes to it, that sort of thing. It helps to know? have support. Yeah. It, it's yeah. good to have somebody with you. <laughs> so Sometimes Mrs. Beats with me, but well, sometimes she's like, "I'm not going out there with you with a Confederate battle flag." Get away. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, uh, is it my turn to ask you? Yes. Okay. What is your prediction for the world, and well, not just world, but domestic? So, Canadian, but also world political trends from now until the year 2030. Oh, from that's not that long. That's only nine years. Nine years. Like, hey, a lot can happen. <laughs> Political trends in the next in the next nine years. Um, well, speaking. I mean, I, I mean, I guess we just kind of have to uh, sort of extrapolate from the trends that we're seeing now, right? Like, if you were to sort of posit, uh, if we were talking in 1981 and we were going to say like, what's going to be the state of politics by 1990? Could you have fairly extrapolated the way that sort of politics would unfold in 1991 from 1981? If I was, a, if we were doing this in 1981 and you were to tell me that, oh yeah, communism would fall by the end of the decade, I would call you crazy. Well, I guess maybe that's not the best analogy because there was so much <laughs> dramatic developments at that, at that time. I mean, I definitely do think that to... Speaking of communism, I do think that we're going to get into a much more kind of like explicit kind of Cold War kind of mentality as far as China goes. Like, I, I just think that 
that has sort of been somewhat implicit or perhaps just a kind of argument that's made by kind of like the hawkish faction of sort of Western society. But I, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if like by the year 2030, we are in a very like explicit kind of Cold War mindset in which it becomes much less controversial just to assert that China is our geopolitical enemy and that all of our foreign policy in the broader Western world should operate on that assumption first and foremost, that we need to sort of curb the power of China. We need to be suspicious of Chinese infiltration in our own societies. And uh, yeah, and just that that becomes... I think not a controversial thing to assert and, and not sort of seen as an overtly hawkish thing. I, I suspect it will become like a kind of broadly bipartisan consensus on both the right and the left when it comes to sort of foreign policy and geostrategic uh, issues. Um, I guess in a more domestic way, like, I mean, I guess, I guess you would sort of have to think that, that populism is, is sort of here to stay in some form or another. Like, I definitely think that, like, I would suspect that the Republican Party, for instance, is, we talked about, about this a little bit earlier, like, I would suspect that the Republican Party of the past is not coming back in any shape or form, and that the future of the Republican Party in the year 2030 will look very much Trumpy, you know, in some form or another. <laughs> and I and I think that that's probably going to be the case with a lot of uh, sort of when we think of, like, right-wing movements are in the world, even sort of respectable right-wing parties, that they'll be in a more sort of populist direction. And I think that the kind of Reagan, Thatcher kind of style consensus politics is, I think, a little bit on the wayside. I don't I don't necessarily believe, and I think that it's sometimes is a little bit of a sort of faulty, uh, a sort of a fallacy of parallelism to kind of assert that the left wing is going to become as populist as the right wing is. I think that there might be aspects mm. of that in sort of more cultural spaces. Like I think that the sort of, uh, you know, the kind of the hyper political correctness that we see in, in academia, that we see in, in the media, that we even sort of see in just sort of social interactions. I suspect that that's going to very much continue, like sort of the heightened sensitivity of language and, uh, and sort of a, a desire to like, any sort of thing that sort of whiffs of bigotry and impolite company will continue to be very taboo. But I don't, I don't sort of see any real signs to suggest that like, like that the left wing parties are, are like marching towards like orthodox Marxism or communism or socialism or anything like that. I, I think that the most aggressive way that, that sort of the society will continue to drift left, I think will be much more in, in kind of like private realms in, in both sort of senses of the word as opposed to like in in sort of the world the realm of of high politics and economic policy and 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 things like that yeah i mostly agree with you yeah i mean i guess it, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty with like specific issues this could be a much longer conversation we won't yeah. get into that but yeah um if you're doing super chats i'm gonna try to get all those at the end here so just so you know like i, I see you and also uh dan is in the chat i saw dan who we were just talking about oh dan, nice in canubis uh yeah dan's the flying here can i show his yeah Oh. There, there he is. Not yeah. easy being rejected a hundred times in two hours. Oh, I don't know what that's a reference to, but when we were doing the Confederate battle flag and the MAGA hat on the street. Oh yeah. There's Canubis. Canubis. Okay. Anyway. All right. Uh, All right. Are, Here's a question for you, Matthew. Um, so which country had more of an influence on rock music, America or England? Oh, <laughs> that's a, that's a fun one. That's a, you know, I'm going to be biased <laughs> and I'm going to say the United States. I mean, uh, you know, look at the, we were mentioning jazz earlier, but also after like big band orchestras and kind of the transition, like um, Chuck Berry. Hello, Chuck yeah. Berry, Buddy Holly, Elvis Presley. Uh, I think the African-American um, influence in particular, like I am tremendously thankful every day for, the African-American influence on music of the world, because goodness, the best music I've ever enjoyed um, has roots in, you know, Africa, the entire continent that, that brought over combined with a bunch of other things. Sure. But like, wow, it's um, and so, yeah, like I think a lot of, like the thing about Britain, you know, like I think what was happening in Britain was the audience was a little bit smarter 
at the time, less kind of like Puritan like. <laughs> Although yeah. apparently Atunshai argues that Puritan Puritans were hippies, actually. But no, uh, so I think the audience is more receptive basically in um in England. So that's why it took off a little bit quicker there. Um, same with punk rock, you know, the United States was a little bit behind, but we still like swallowed it up. So Did it, does America have a punk tradition? Oh yeah. Like mostly New York. Um, the, the New York punk scene in, in the late seventies was pretty strong. What would be, what would be like the, the leading bands? Of, of the American pop. Uh, I mean, I always first think of the Ramones, even though people make oh, yeah, fun yeah. of that. But uh, yeah, that's that's a good example. Actually, I'm very ignorant about music, as you can probably tell. Well, that was one of my, my one of my questions for you was related to that. So maybe I should ask that next. Oh yeah, so, yes. Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say because I I was thinking about about that. I was like, I've never heard JJ reference music, his favorite music, in one of his videos, and we never talked about it. So. What is your favorite type of music? And don't just say I like to listen to a little bit of everything. That well, I kind of, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of do. I mean, like I like I every week I look forward to Spotify's, uh, you know, that weekly recommendation thing where they just kind of give you music to listen to, so I don't have to uh, decide for myself what I like. You know, I used to, I used to love listening to the radio. I used to love listening to the Sirius XM. Uh, radio when I was driving in those days. The Verge. Um, that's one of my favorite series oh, channels. I used Most to listen to. Artists. I used to listen to one was called XMU, which was just oh, kind yeah, of like, XMU. yeah, yeah. I don't know, sort of indie hipster kind of schlock. I guess that's mostly what I listen to. I really do not have good or sophisticated taste in music at all. <laughs> like my, I, I feel like I kind of still have the mindset of like a five year old when it comes to music. Like I like songs that are that are catchy and that I can easily memorize and sing to myself. You know, it's it's I'm I'm quite self conscious of like just how lackluster my knowledge of music is, and and when people I meet people like you, who have a sort of depth of knowledge about music and can listen to sort of like serious, uh, significant bands and appreciate you know guitar solos and all of this kind of thing, it's something that like I just cannot relate to. It's almost like they're speaking a, a foreign language, and it's not to say like I don't like music. But I, I do think that I just am not a very sophisticated listener and I can't appreciate music. I guess because like I've never been musical myself. I've never played musical instruments. Music was not something that really fascinated me when I was young, which I guess is unusual for a young man of my generation. Like just that I never kind of and I had like friends that did like I had friends that got swept up in. Uh, I remember my friend Matthew, for instance, like he loved, uh, you know, loved Pearl Jam, loved, uh, loved Nirvana you know, loved, uh, you know, some of the other sort of uh, 90s era bands that arose, you know, loved the Foo Fighters and and stuff like that. And and he was so passionate about this kind of stuff. And I just could never, it just did nothing for me. Like, it was just hard for me to to kind of care. It's like music is music. Music is just pleasant things to listen to in the background when you're working. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know what it is. I, so I, I remember I once heard somebody describe not liking a specific thing and they described it as like, I guess I'm just missing that G. And I kind of sometimes feel like that. Like maybe I'm just missing the the music gene. I have a lot of appreciation for other types of art, but that's one that's just there's something about it that's just never fully clicked with me. I, there was a study. Sorry, bring up studies again. Um, do you get chills when you hear a really good song? No. Okay, I do, and I think that's a weird. Um, that's a weird evolutionary thing here. I was going to, there's like, okay, here it is. About 50% of people get chills when listening to music research shows that because I know this is the first thing that popped up mental floss. Okay. But no, I've, I've read this before. Like it's like half of the population. Uh, and so when you say that that was kind of rare, actually, I think it's more common than you think. I think it's 50, 50. Cause I've had friends too, that like, you know, I mean, I'll listen to it. It's, if it's, you know, like I, I, I have it on uh, regularly, but there's something about like, um, I don't know. It's like a visceral thing, you know, for half the population. And I guess I would be in that, that half. Is it, is it like chills consistently? Like if you listen to the same song, you always uh, get chills. Well, like it, like, uh, you know, the, there's a song that's one of my all time favorite songs by U2 called one and where he, sings high at the end like where yeah. I goosebumps get a little bit and it's every time or every like time. 
or if I watch the music video for REM's uh, "Everybody Hurts," I automatically just think of like everything sad in my life, and I tear tear up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like oh, it's a it's a weird thing, like an emotional, like impulsive thing, and it's like I think it's just. This has got to be evolutionary. I don't know. Like it's funny. Yeah, uh, it's funny. It's funny we're discussing this because I had a rare kind of moment of this recently. Because like I was watching an episode of The Simpsons, you know, my most favorite show, and there was an episode recently that was like a satire of The Smiths, you know, yeah. with Morrissey, and uh, and then I, I realized I didn't didn't really know anything about the Smiths. And so I, I watched a YouTube video of one of their performances, you know, when Morrissey was a young, sexy dude. And it was like very compelling to me, like his voice. And I don't know if this is just because he's such a, he was so attractive when he was young, but like there was something very hypnotic about his voice and his presentation and, you know, the way he was moving and all of that. And that gave me a bit of the kind of thrill that I haven't had with a music listening experience in quite a long time in living memory. So maybe it's just that I haven't really sort of consumed enough of the right kind of music and forced well, myself particularly to see the live performances as well i think yeah you can have a very powerful experience and i've seen very very little live music in my entire life i think maybe only like three concerts that some friend has dragged me to or something yeah <laughs> try 300 for me Good like, Lord. literally uh plus playing shows like yeah that's a whole not another dynamic but okay well it's your turn <laughs> Because I asked the music question, which I skipped ahead. I oh, yeah. I guess you did. Um, okay, here we go. Here's a good question. So what what is the most legitimately educational Hollywood movie about American history, about a period of American history? Like, if you had to force your class to, like, watch a good Hollywood film about a historical thing, what would it be? I saw a cynical historian in the chat earlier. Oh, yes. He would be a better person to ask this, but because he has that whole series like where it's based on a true story, and he he like look compares like what really happened to these um, these movies. But I don't know where he's at in the chat now. But um, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this. Um, a lot I find out later on that like the video or the the films that I thought were historically accurate apparently were not <laughs> at all. Um, but I think there's something to be said about it doesn't necessarily matter if it's completely historically accurate. If it, because I, I've told people this before publicly, but a big reason why I got into history um, was it's a little embarrassing to say, but was Forrest Gump. Oh, yeah. um, because the fact that I was so into that movie and then it, it opened my eyes to all these like, things and i find out that like oh that really that what that really happened too he shot he got shot too he got shot too well what the heck's going on that uh, like it opened my eyes at, like that nonfiction was more exciting than fiction and like the best stuff is really happened and um and so i think that there's something to be said about that um as far as what i showed to my students over the years um uh, i always like a lot of times i showed them Lincoln, which is mm. not the whole thing because it was it's a little dry for especially for middle schoolers. Um, actually, middle schoolers really enjoyed Glory. I used to play Glory as well. Um, I played Platoon. And the main re main reason why I played Platoon, I know Cynical Historian would make fun of me for this. But the um, yeah, some things were exaggerated in that. But um, Oliver Stone, who directed that, he was a Vietnam vet. He experienced firsthand combat. And a lot of times these directors who make these movies are very disconnected from what really goes on, especially with warfare movies, war movies. A lot of times it's either glorified or like Stanley Cooper tries to make it look like darker than maybe it was in certain situations, whatever it is. Um, if you actually lived it and then you later tell the story about it, I'm, I usually respect it more. And, um, you know, Oliver Stone had bad movies too, like JFK. Uh, <laughs> But uh, let's see. What else did I show? Um, I mean, I felt like a lot of times I was showing clips, not the whole film, because, you know, th this is the this is something they got right. You know, like Saving yeah. Private Ryan. The, I think that the closest that we can get kids to experience what it really was like on Omaha Beach that day, June 6, 1944, that's, you know, that's pretty as close as we're going to get, I guess, you know? Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I mean, that's an interesting attitude to have, like the idea that the, 
you can judge the films on the basis of their parts rather than mm -hmm. necessarily the whole. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. All right. Uh, we have three more each, right? I think so, yes. Yeah, well, this is taking a while. Uh, sorry we're neglecting the chat, but thanks for everyone for being here. Uh, so if you were to put stuff in a time capsule uh, right now, okay, today, uh, what would you put in it? And when would you open it? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> What would you put in the time capsule and when would you open it? Or, I definitely or maybe feel like somebody, maybe somebody in the future after you die opens it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I definitely feel like uh, the big problem with time capsules, which are not, I think, taken at all seriously by legitimate archaeologists, is that they often have like far too brief uh, a, a sort of window. Fleeting. You know, it's like I, I saw there's like a time capsule not far from where I live under some statue. And it's like, you know, it's from like 50 years ago. It's like, I think that we kind of have a reasonably good image of what life was like 50 years ago. I'm not sure we're going to really gain any great insights by seeing a few like rotted newspapers or whatever from that era. But I feel like if I wanted to do a, I think like a 200 years would be a good time period for a, a time capsule. I think that is a significant enough time where basically the living memory connected to that period is so sort of far removed that it would seem, I think, legitimately uh, exciting to be in contact with artifacts from that time period. It couldn't um, be papers. <laughs> what's that? It couldn't be papers then. They no, probably... it couldn't. It couldn't be papers. It's, I don't know. It's, 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 it's hard to say. Like, I suppose maybe you just I really want to put like very, very dated, very, very of the moment, like sort of frivolous objects. Like if there's any sort of like toy or article of clothing or, you know, like just some sort of like really sort of cheap novelty, because I suspect that those are often the kind of things that people's instincts are not to include because they want to sort of have a kind of like higher aspiration to these sorts of things. So I think spinner in the, in the chat, I saw fidget spinner. Yeah. So, so something like that, or even like, like very sort of dated, maybe like technology, like, I don't know, like you put a current version of the phone in there or something, or a current version of the AirPods or something like, cause I think that in the future too, like that strikes me as the kind of stuff that's most likely to kind of like fascinate the kind of lay person who's going to encounter it. You know, like I said, like time capsules are not considered serious history. Like they're not serious archeology. span They're kind of like lay archeology span and they're, they're uh, you know, the people that unveil them are like, you know, the city elders or whatever. And then they get some polite write up in like the local newspaper or something. <laughs> and so knowing that that's the intended audience, that this is not actually a legitimate way to like preserve history for future generations. I think you kind of have to buy it, sit towards things that might seem a little bit frivolous, but are sort of the present day equivalent of the sort of day-to-day -day objects that a person 200 years from now we infer are still likely to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis so that would be sort of like common technology common toys common sort of objects like clothing or or or, or tools you know yeah i knew you'd have a good answer for that one i <laughs> i because i don't really have as good an answer like that's what i got you know he, i'm not even gonna try an answer now all right so <laughs> Here's my question for you, Matthew. So what is the biggest upside of living in a place like Kansas? Oh, well, the first thing I think of is cost of living. It's cheap to live here. Oh, yes. I mean, especially working online, like, you know, you're still getting the same. I mean, we're a global economy now. I'm, I'm working with uh, folks around the world, literally. Um, and it's, it can be quite nice when it transfers to <laughs> from certain places versus others. Um, now, as far as I really don't, I, I mean, when I was younger, I took it for granted, but now I don't. And it is the, the space and like, it's just not that crowded. If I go downtown to, uh, you know, go out to eat with the family, we don't have trouble finding a parking spot. You know, the fact that we can drive down there to begin with, you know, is, is pretty amazing. Um, so it's not that crowded. It's, um, the air is cleaner. Uh, water is relatively clean here compared to some other states. Uh, yeah, you occasionally get the smell of manure, you know, a very <laughs> area. But um, now, 
politically, I wish it was a little bit more open-minded and, uh, but you know, it's like, it's kind of good though. Cause I don't want to be around people I agree with on everything. I think that's not something I, I, a lot of people kind of escape to their little cocoon neighborhoods or cities that, you know, Oh, we all polit politically agree, but I, I don't really see that as much around where I live. Um, yeah. I mean, I wish there were mountains. I, I, I love <laughs> mountains and I, we are nowhere near mountains here. <laughs> now, one thing, one thing I, I sort of respect about you and people like you who come from, you know, places like where you come from and what you are in sort of in reference to the politics is that you know how to navigate people of different beliefs. Right. And I think that that's something that, people can sort of lose track of, right? Like people can think that they're very, uh, that they're very tolerant or that they're very, you know, open-minded or that they understand, you know, quote unquote, what the other side thinks. But if they grow up in a situation in which they're only exposed to people like them, I think it's very easy for them to sort of drift into, uh, you know, cliches and caricatures and, and, and so on. But like somebody like you that actually has to deal with people that think very differently just because there's no escaping it, right? It's like you just have to be able to sort of navigate certain conversations, you know, certain opinions when you're confronted with them. I think that's a very useful useful skill that I think people, particularly people, I mean, I guess I can only sort of speak of like myself, like someone from a very urban sort of setting, talking to somebody from a, somebody like you, who I think comes from a sort of more rural sort of setting, like just the fact that you have a more detailed understanding of what like your typical sort of rural or smaller town person is like than I do. Whereas I think that you have also been to many big cities because, you know, everybody goes to big cities if they travel at all. Yeah. And I think that there's often a kind of disequilibrium in which sort of people from rural settings often go to big cities, but people from big cities often don't go to rural settings. And thus people like me are sort of always sort of kind of missing half of their, uh, you know, understanding of the public. Well, but there's a bit of a misconception too, though, because like Kansas city where we lived for many years, um, it's 2 million people. I mean, it's, it's not small and it's, it feels like Chicago oftentimes. Yeah. You're, so like, uh, and, but I know some people will say, well, Chicago, that's nothing compared to LA or New York. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's it, a lot of times I think the world is more connected now than ever. And it's more, also more the same than ever. Yeah. So like you're not by moving out to the middle of nowhere, you're not really missing out as much as you used to. Like, especially I remember like growing up in Kansas, uh, you know, I mentioned MTV earlier, but like a lot of times the trends, the fashion trends, we would be like the last to the party, you know, like, yes. oh, holes in your jeans is cool. OK. I mean, I guess that was cool in L.A. two years ago. But hey, at least we're we we, we caught up to you now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. A lot quicker these days with TikTok. You know exactly. What <laughs> oh, that's cool. All right. Uh, Do more. Right. OK. I think so. Yeah. Favorite, oh, this is kind of related to your question. Favorite places you visited, uh, and then where do you want to go next? Like, especially after the pandemic's over. Um, well, I, I have a, a list of places I, I want to go. Um, I would like to go back to Japan. I lived in Japan for a year, uh, close to 12 years ago now. And, um, you know, that's I didn't enjoy my time in Japan at all. I was quite miserable. I was glad to leave. But, you know, enough time has passed that now sort of a bit of the nostalgia is starting to kick in and I'd like to see my old neighborhood. I'd like to sort of see how much things have changed in the decades since I've been there. So that, that was actually something that I had wanted to do, uh, you know, this year, but you know, it's not really in the cards. Um, I really want to go to visit South Africa at some point. That's a country that has fascinated me for a very long time. And it's kind of like one of the big, big check marks on my list. I haven't, uh, haven't done yet. So that's definitely, uh, that's definitely there. In terms of like my favorite places that I've been, I mentioned earlier in this chat that I had gone to Israel a few years ago. That was a really remarkable uh, trip. I mean, that was the first time I'd ever sort of like really traveled on one of these all-inclusive tours where, you know, they just drive you around and take you places and tell you like, and that, you know, I guess me becoming an old man, like uh, not <laughs> wanting to plan my own trips quite so much, like sort of seeing how much you can get out of having someone plan a trip for you. That was, re that made my trip to Israel, I think like as good as a trip to Israel could possibly have been. So like, yeah. I just saw so much of the country and 
had a really fantastic tour guide and got to see all of the top museums and all the top historical sites. And that was, it was just really like, uh, that's a memory I will remember forever. Like that trip I took there a few years ago. So, but uh, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of good trips. I mean, I've, I've, I've very much enjoyed all of the traveling I've done in the U S I, I love spending time in America. I love going to California time that I spent in New York was, was fantastic as well. But uh yeah, I mean, the most, I, uh, that trip to Israel was by far sort of like the most kind of sensational trip I've ever been on, just because often I don't go on super ambitious trips. You know, often I just travel to visit a city, to visit some friends, and you know, I learn stuff while I'm there, but I've never been like a serious hardcore traveler. And so that that trip to Israel was, I suppose, a sort of a taste of a kind of travel that I'd never done before. Well, you went to Chile the, a couple of years ago. I did. Too. That was that was that was fun. I mean, that was that was more of a kind of conventional JJ trip, though. You know, I went to Santiago uh, yeah. and I spent two weeks in Santiago, mostly just hung out with my friends and just kind of wandered around the city and observed a lot of stuff about Chile. But it was not, uh, you know, it's not a you're just so much, adventure. You're more well traveled than I am. I, I, I that's another embarrassing thing. I, I think um, I just I the only countries I've been to are um, other than the United States or Canada uh jamaica mexico but why why is that why have you not traveled more um i mean a combination of obligations and i mean mostly just i decided certain things were more important although i've always loved traveling and so is um mrs beat but yeah we we plan to change that you know she went to europe without me um <laughs> okay yeah, why well, the deal was I went to Alaska, drove to Alaska, and she got to fly to Europe. So she didn't. I, I traveled. Alaska. I traveled a lot when I was when I was young. Like when I was in college, I would often go on trips to Europe uh, at the end of the semester, right? Like so that yeah. was a very sort of convenient opportunity. And I guess like you know, to be fair, I've I've been single for my whole life, so that's, that's the thing. given me a lot fewer obligations, right? I got married pretty young. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. That's like, and then you know. When you, so when you have kids, I'll throw it yeah. out the window. But uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess it's your turn. Yeah, is it? Um, yeah. I think so. Okay, so what is your earliest political memory? Oh, my early, I yeah, I actually, I know it. It's okay. when I was uh, 1988, um, the general election debate between Michael Dukakis and uh, George H.W. Bush. I okay. remember sitting on the couch watching it and like, mommy, what's going on? And she was trying to explain to me. I just, I don't know why I vividly remember that. Um, <laughs> this was the, uh, <clears throat> the infamous like um, Kitty Dukakis. If she was raped, would you care uh, debate? I think, right. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't understand anything. I mean, I think I was like six or something, seven at the time, probably six. Yeah. So I was like, you know, <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. But yeah, I do remember it. And, um, and you, re you remember you remember the old man Bush being the president of the U.S. as well. I do. I do. I remember yeah. like and I think more so through my parents would watch Saturday Night Live and I'd sneak up to see what they were watching. You know, when I was not supposed to be awake and it, he would be. uh who was it? Uh, Dana Carvey did an impersonation of him. Uh, <laughs> yes. It's funny how like people are like SNL. They they were so critical of President Trump. I'm like, have you not known the entire history of SNL? They make fun <laughs> of all the presidents. <laughs> yes. I remember um, I remember Phil Hartman doing uh, Bill Clinton, and that was always really hilarious. Oh, well, he did Ronald Reagan too, right? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. Did. It's funny how some of them did multiple presidents, but that, yeah, I didn't really, it was presidential stuff that I focused on, which I think yeah. most kids these days, like that's how they first get caught up in it. And then they discover Congress. Yes, <laughs> yes, <that>. yes. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Well, last question here. This is, this is an easy question. I got, I got a softball for you to end things. Okay. All right. Uh, peace in the Middle East. How? Okay, well, and the I world have, for that matter, and the I world. Have, if you want to expand it. <laughs> so, I have taken, as I said, I have been to Israel. Therefore, I'm a complete <laughs> expert on the entire subject. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's like in in all seriousness, like I, I going to Israel. 
did really sort of make you realize, I think, some of the the challenges that face the people there, because the it is much more integrated, I think, when we're talking about the Israeli-Palestinian situation. Mm -hmm. Like so many Palestinians, you know, cross the border to work in Israel. I mean, there's obviously a lot of these, you know, settlers, uh, Jewish migrants in the Palestinian areas that have they, like set up these condos and things. Like I remember like I'd heard about like, you know, the settlers as sort of a phenomenon. But when you, I suppose when you hear of settler, like you think like, oh, maybe it's like some guy with like a tent or you know, like he's just building. But it's like, no, it's like these huge like, complex condos that are just like built up in the hills and the West Bank. And like, that's a quote unquote settlement. And then you see like, you know, the large number of Palestinians that are, you know, working in, in Jerusalem, you know, Jerusalem's very sort of multicultural city, but you know, there's Palestinians all over Israel who, as I said, cross the border to work there. So I don't know. It's just like, it's, it, it really does feel like the idea that you could just sort of cleanly sort these two people onto two sides and just get it all to work out really seems really like very far off and really like an abstraction that is not, uh, you know, that is just not the lived reality of these people there. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I hope, I hope that this is something that we see resolved in, in our lifetimes, but it really sort of seems like the kind of thing that, that we're just kind of drifting into a kind of stagnation towards like that. There's just going to kind of be this kind of like grim status quo. That's never going to be fully resolved. Maybe perhaps not unlike the, uh, the North Korea, South Korea situation, or like the Taiwan China situation, like that at some point, like there just becomes an equilibrium where everybody's just kind of like, well, this isn't ideal, but you know, it's, it is what it is. And, I don't know. It's it's not a satisfying answer, but I mean, you were not asking it in a in a serious way, so I kind of was. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a. I've been exploring the one state solution more and more. Like, and uh, I don't know enough. I'm not anywhere near an expert. I took one course in college and thought that I was cool, but I just think that um, at this point, you know, I mean, this is why history is so important because like, that's literally, it's the, all this momentum of the last 100 years, it's really been more than a hundred years now that's been creating what we're seeing today. And like, I, uh, I think the, you know, a lot of hatred is, it's just taught. It, it's just taught. And so I think, um, if I, I mean, if I were to answer this question, I would lean towards what can be a way where we can we can increase empathy. And I think that simply just means forcing people to interact that normally wouldn't interact. I mean, so many Americans could benefit from just studying abroad a semester in college, like uh, just not to be so dang like pompous about like, you know, how ridiculous is it to just think that like, oh yeah, we're the ones who got it all figured out and everyone else is completely wrong. Like, uh, and I think you're just, it's the same thing that I was, you know, growing up, I was talking about like, you know, the more different types of people you meet that open your eyes to things you never even considered before. I think that's a microcosm of what we can do with the world. And I've seen, I think that's, that was my hope for the internet in the early days. You know, it's like, this will be connecting people that otherwise would not be connecting. Now our tribal instincts like cause us to go to our little corners of the internet. But I think if we can figure that problem out where we're forced to like interact, then maybe just maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely one sort of thing that I, I, I did sort of grapple with when I was there as well is that, you know, like it kind of goes almost back to sort of what we were sort of saying at the very beginning when we we're talking about like sort of the 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 problems with the the French Canadians are sort of my my critique of of some of the things that their government does right like they're one of the challenges I think that really does define our age is is this sort of this question of nationalism and collective rights right like do different communities have a fundamental right to self govern on the basis of upholding the integrity of their sort of national cultural identity. And is that objective one that is on some level more important than democracy, more important than, you know, classical liberalism of individual rights. And I do think that like that is really an issue that is very much at the core of the, of the Israeli Palestinian thing, regardless of what side you're on, because you are sort of talking about like, does the, 
does sort of like, you know, President Wilson's old idea of sort of national self-determination, right? Like, is that still the highest good that we can aspire to in a society? And if it's not, then what does that mean? Like, is there a process through which you can kind of talk people out of, you know, a kind of nationalism of, uh, of identity, of, of, of faith, of peoplehood, of ethnicity? Can you talk them out of that and persuade them into a kind of more multicultural, liberal, democratic identity of the sort that we have on this continent? You know, or is that itself a kind of like arrogant imposition where it's just kind of like a, a model of society that we have for ourselves that works on this continent is not in fact transferable. And that was sort of something that I, I sort of had to struggle with a lot because I do think that in both Canada and America, we have a political culture that really sort of teaches us to believe that our societies are built on enlightenment values, you know, enlightenment sort of liberal individualism, and that this is not just an American or a Canadian idea, that in some respects, this is a universal idea. And thus, it should, in, in theory, be transferable to any society and bring peace to any society. It's like Afghanistan. On. Is that easy? Well, exactly. Right. And I think Afghanistan and, and uh, really sort of illustrates that in a way. And I think that's very difficult. I think it's very difficult to concede that because, like, you know, this is often sort of framed as like, oh, you know, Amer arrogant Americans think they can make people do whatever. And it's like, you know, there's an element of that as well. But there's also, you know, a good faith aspect to that as well, where it's kind of place like, you know, this the America is a success in so many ways. Like America is a success of multicultural uh, democracy and people of all different parts of the world getting along together. Right. So it is not completely without justification that people would think that there is some lesson that America could teach other parts of the world as a successful multicultural liberal democracy. And I think that the fact that what we thought of was a universal model might actually be a much more particularly American limited success story that is a product of very particular American variables. And that is, I think, that's that's kind of hard. You know, that in some respects is the end of a kind of American exceptionalism. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, anyway, I, I agree with most of that. But you have one more question here. Don't let you? me ask you. Yes, let me ask. Okay. And this is a kind of a more a lighter question, I suppose. So I often like to ask this question to YouTubers because I think it reveals something. But it's like if your if your fans, Matthew, could lock you in a room and force you to only make one kind of video forever, what kind of video would you be making forever? presidents videos <laughs> what kind of videos though like just talking about presidents yeah talking about every president like what was the shoe <laughs> size of every president in america history? and i probably will make that at one point <laughs> i need i just need to make i just need to give into it and, and go ahead and make those just they, they do well and i i resist them and it's like self-sabotage when i don't make them and why, why are people so fascinated by by presidents even even now that's me i mean that's my childhood yeah. it still continues i i think well, I've been asked this question in interviews and I, I have a hard time answering it for some reason, but I think what it really, I, I've thought more about it since. And it's the fact that these, um, they're not born into it, but they're given so much power. They're basically Kings of the world mm. and, and it's fleeting. It's just, sometimes it's just like two years or 30 days in William Henry Harrison's yeah. case. And like, you just, and then after you're done, oh, the secret service is gone. And you go back to like, okay, you're a nobody again. And that, you notice the camaraderie these former presidents have, like, it's amazing. Now, Trump is an exception because of who he is, but, you you know, Obama, uh, George W. Bush, Jimmy Carter, and uh, Bill Clinton, the ex-presidents, like, this is our club, and we know what we went through, and the heck with our political differences. You're my brother, you know? Yes, yes. And that, that's, I think, that shows you, like, how unique it is, and there's only only been 45 of them and yeah i don't know and i i think the there's going to be a new di dynamic when there's finally the first female president but um i i think that also that that's why a lot of young boys like myself were drawn into it like <laughs> a lot of these guys were poor men that poor boys like myself that did, uh, all of a sudden they're <laughs> launched onto the stage so yeah it's so the presidency is very, very structured as well, I think, in a way that sort of gives it a lot of uh, heft, you know, like, you know, you have eight years, you know, you have four year chunks, four year chunks, like, and most, I mean, like, obviously, there's been deaths and things, but like, I think yeah. 
in, in certainly in the last, yeah, I don't know how many years it's been since there's been a disruption, like it is a very sort of like stable uh, order of, of, uh, of presidents, you know, in these four year chunks, it's very tight and tidy. Whereas in a lot of other countries, I do think that, you know, you have people that are like acting presidents who serve for like a couple months and then they go away. And then like, yeah. there's much like the, the system, like you can't sort of venerate, like, you know, I have the, uh, <laughs> I have like this, you know, children's book about the presidents, right? Like, it's it's because the presidency is so is so structured and so well timed and American oh, elections are so tidy. It's it's I think it's a bit easier to revere them in a kind of kingly kind of way, right? Than it would be in in some other systems. I think where people come and go in a bit more fluid. That's a really good point. I didn't even think about that. Um, I figured we try to tackle a few, a few these questions yeah. before we go like real quick. Um, Dylan wanted to know if, if Biden will be reelected in 2024. I still think that he's not running for reelection. I have a, I think it's going to be Harris or someone else for the Democrats. That's my prediction. What do you think about O'Toole, JJ? Well, I mean, I just, I just wrote a column today in the Washington Post saying that I think O'Toole should leave. I think that O'Toole has manifestly failed, uh, and I don't think he deserves a second chance. I mean, O'Toole had a very uh, you know, he had a bold theory of, of how to win this election. And, you know, kudos for him. I think, you know, bold people should be rewarded. O'Toole ran very far to the left, uh, more so to the left than any conservative has ever run for prime minister in this country. He called himself a progressive. He said that this was going to allow him to make inroads with new uh, groups who don't traditionally vote conservative. What we saw on election day was that the conservative party lost seats. They lost the popular or they lost their percentage of the popular vote. It went down and they lost their uh, overall total of the popular vote. So that's like a three, that's like failing, failing in three different ways. It's certainly much more than Andrew Scheer did. And I think Andrew Scheer had to, you know, suffer for his much milder loss. I think O'Toole should suffer for his as well. Hmm. Suffer O'Toole. Uh, so this person wants us to be on Joe Rogan. Uh, I don't think either of us are famous enough for, for Joe Rogan. <laughs> uh, January 6th insurrection. I, I've already shared my comment on this. So well, I mean, it's, I think it was a terrible thing. I mean, it's abhorrent. And I very much don't like how the Republican Party seems to be drifting into a kind of revisionism about it in which it is now sort of seen not only like I think the earlier phrase was kind of like denialism that it was like no big deal and who cares and now I think it's kind of crossing the line into sort of saying like the people who did January 6 were like objectively good and were like heroes and that kind of thing and I think that's something really to be uh really to be denounced yeah that's disturbing to me um um I yeah I've never heard of this documentary our town I'll check it out um yeah i there's some like I think the the perfect size of a city is about a hundred thousand because you it's big enough where you can be a stranger but also small enough where you can know your your community uh, members occasionally see people you know and plus you have a certain amount of amenities you know yeah I, like my hometown actually had about eight thousand people that was a little too small everybody knew. <laughs> <your> <laughs> uh, I lost a lot of these super chats sorry everyone. Um, well, this has been fun. Yeah, yeah. it has been fun. I, it was I, a good. It was a good, a very, uh, very sort of like intimate adult uh, conversation. I feel we had uh, <laughs> learned a lot about each other. Adult. We probably scared some kids away. Then I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean like adult in the sort of sense, like mature. You know, like we're two adults talking to each other about sort of life and grown up things. It's not just sort of like silly. You know, it's the sort of stuff that I think, unfortunately, sometimes uh, live streams can descend into. So I appreciate you sort of yeah. having a higher sort of aspiration for this. <laughs> this is on Twitch, too, by the way. I'm oh, is that so? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to build up a following over there. I'm thinking about doing more of these live streams where I told I messaged you this, but like where I do reactions to videos and like because I um, it also kind of helps me learn along the way it's an excuse for me to kind of get out of my comfort zone <laughs> and yeah. see that in real time when oh i mean i think it, i think it's a i think it's a good model like i'd like to see you have i'd like to like watch you have a conversation like this with with uh with another creator i think it would be uh i think it'd be yeah. very valuable it's okay. fun to learn it's fun to learn about people i think i mean like i'm very interested in in people and like people who can as hopefully we have done tonight you know is sort of analyze 
from a personal perspective, right? Like you can talk about yourself, but you can also tell your story in a way that hopefully relates to sort of larger themes, particularly when, you know, you're interested in, in subjects like history and politics, which are ultimately, you know, very driven by the individual. Man, maybe we created a series here then tonight. Well, thanks for being on the premiere episode. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, okay. The, I've never got this question before on this channel. Surprisingly, has marijuana become too prevalent in our society? Do you I feel mean, it's prevalent in, in where you live? It's the same as it's always been. It was easier to get marijuana when I, when I was in high school than it was alcohol. I mean, it was. Oh, yeah. Now, the stuff these days is probably stronger, I bet, because of, you know, it's legal. Most of the United States now is legal, and then all of Canada is legal. So, yeah. I, I wonder if society, I wonder if, like, you know, how do you think that's changing our societies? Like, because I think it actually is going to have a big effect. I think. Have you noticed that people are nicer? <laughs> like, or take road rage. Do you think road? I mean, you should be drive. Don't drive and do this. No, when thing. you're using pot, it's bad. Yeah, I mean, really I like I take I take a much more sort of critical view of it. I mean, I've always been pretty critical of marijuana and legalization and all of that. I mean, my sort of theory, and I, I wrote about this once, is that you know. Tobacco was like smoking cigarettes was not a mainstream thing until the dawn of the 20th century. Right. And there was like a very concerted effort on the part of the tobacco companies to persuade Americans that smoking tobacco cigarettes was good and cool and liberating. And, you know, only weird fuddy duddies had a problem with it. And then gradually over the course of the 20th century, we slowly learned that it was bad. And then government steps in and regulates it and bans it and all the rest of it. And I sometimes worry that we're just destined to go through that entire cycle again with marijuana. You know, like right now we're at the phase where we sort of think that there's something like fundamentally emancipatory about sort of consuming marijuana. But, you know, I, I think that there's plenty of reason to believe that the uh, that the the medical consequences, the, the health consequences of this are, are much more serious than we've previously thought. I think that a lot of digging into that right now is being sort of stigmatized as like, oh, that's just what cool, uncool squares say. And, you know, who would have a problem? Like smoking is, is a sign of freedom. And, you know, it's a way to, you know, it's, it's even medicine. Like it's objectively good for you. We should all be smoking. Like it just so much of it reminds me of like how we dealt with tobacco cigarettes in the early days. And I, I, I very much think that, you know, if we're going to talk about like where society is going to be, uh, you know, in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I, I do think we're going to look back at this period and the way that marijuana was consumed and sold and marketed and advertised and the kind of laissez-faire attitude. I, I think it will be looked back as, as, as quite irresponsible in the same way that we look back at those, you know, doctors prefer Chesterfields, you know, ads that you saw in, in the early 20th century. Oh, that's interesting. I probably disagree with you here, honestly. <laughs> we agree on most things. Now, yeah, like I, I do see your point. Like, I mean, the studies that come out that say there's a negative effect um, because of marijuana, I do see the backlash. And I mean, there is major concern with if you're especially if you're under 25 years old and your brain's not fully developed. There's quite a bit of evidence that it screws up your brain um, and especially smoking it, um, you know, versus consuming it orally. Um, you know, that smoke's going in your lungs, just like with uh, tobacco smoke. Um, but I will say that, um, <laughs> you know, nicotine and uh, cigarettes and alcohol, especially, I think alcohol yeah. is one of the worst things you could possibly ever consume. Um, and we see binge drinking just completely accepted by society. And then they tried yes. it. They tried getting rid of it and it didn't work out very well. People drink more. More people died from alcohol during prohibition in the United States. And those dang Canadians were sneaking it in. <laughs> No, but uh, like I, I, I think that obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we do that are bad for us, but um, I think it's better generally to not make a law to force people not to make a personal choice that's harmful. Like I, I think the most common example is people eat at Waffle House. I mean, I think people <laughs> are eating sugar. Like, look at the look. At, I, I'm serious. Sugar is one of the most damaging things to society uh, today. And yet you don't see any calls for banning sugar or. Well, I wonder about that, though. Like, I, I, I wonder if, if that is sort of a social change that we're going to witness in the next couple of decades that maybe people don't quite see coming. You maybe know, I made that happen instead of the like the you said, like the cycle, maybe the cycle yeah. with new new targets. 
Yeah, perhaps. Like, you know, I made I made a video recently that was that was quite uh, popular, a short uh, about the way that the Mexican government is now trying to crack down on sugar. And I heard that in Latin America, this is actually relatively po popular. When I was in Chile, I, I saw this as well. You know, they have like sort of big Surgeon General style warning labels on excessively unhealthy snacks and oh. you can't ever... You can't uh, advertise them to children anymore. And like, you know, they're trying to limit the supply and all sorts of things like that. And yeah, I mean, like, again, this is I think I think you're absolutely right. Like, I think that I think that it's it's very possible to imagine a future in which we look back at this and like they just the completely like no nutritional quality at all food that cluttered up our store shelves and things will look be, be looked back on as, as like something that was quite embarrassing and quite uh, <laughs> you know just just quite quite grotesque in the same way that our attitude towards uh, tobacco was in, in the early 20th century yeah definitely um just to answer this quickly tyler thanks for the chat iwo jima i i always told my students when i taught about it um that um the reason why iwo jima is so significant is because that's kind of when we knew that Maybe we got to think about another way to fight Japan. When I say we, the allied allied powers uh, and, you know, the Manhattan Project was in full swing at that by that point. And we seriously began to say, OK, this is I, I'm, I'm not thinking it's a good idea to even if we do get to the mainland of Japan, if it, we just go in and attack um, because of what happened at Iwo Jima. So uh, tell your grandpa if he's still around. Uh, thank you for his services. Any comments on Iwo Jima? I, I really don't know much about uh, World War II. I'm sorry to say, so I don't have much useful things to say. No, that's a, oh, whoops. What's it? Oh, sorry. There's another one here. I, I love this. I love this feature though of putting it, the comments up on the screen. Isn't it cool? Yeah, I, it I, is I cool. Forgot I had it um, with the nice big, uh, the nice big uh, user picture as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some of these are great. This was for you, it looks like, or maybe uh, I go to an Anglo University in Quebec's Eastern Townships, a region that used to be very English, but but has since done a 180. Oh, this is just a, uh, he just yeah. wanted to say that. Okay. Yeah, see people, a lot of people are not aware that Jefferson Davis, after the war, uh, lived in Quebec for a time. And that was, uh, that That's was, right. uh, that was sort of seen as something that the Canadians were very proud of, you know, like people forget that as well. There was a lot of pro-Confederate sentiment in, in, in Canada during the civil war because of how, you know, anti-American Canadians were, and you know, that the British were also, you know, at least open-minded about the Confederacy. Should Jagmeet Singh resign as NDP leader? I think he probably should again, like O'Toole, like he has just failed to deliver the goods. Jagmeet Singh has now twice lost. Jagmeet Singh also had a very novel theory of how to increase the NDP's vote share. He thought that, you know, by going on TikTok and social media and really aggressively doing outreach to young people, he would uh, make gains for the NDP and make the party more competitive. He hasn't. And I think that, I think it's very important in, in Canadian politics for, for politicians to, uh, to be accountable for their failures. And I really just don't like this idea that that politicians can just, you know, I mean, this is, I suppose a difference between Canadian and American politics is that, you know, in, in you know, like in American politics, like if you want to be the nominee for president, you have to fight for it a second time. If Trump, you know, Trump will have an easy run if he wants to run again. But, you know, in theory, uh, any, person has to sort of, you know, go through the vigors of winning a primary again. In Canada, once you're nominated to be the candidate for prime minister, once you're nominated to be head of the party, you can basically just hold on to that job as long as you want, right? And I think that that's bad. I think that we should have a kind of more, I mean, we already kind of do have a more American sort of culture in which normally when someone loses a bid for prime minister, they step down following the election. And I think that, uh, I don't like this idea that, that Jagmeet Singh, who's lost twice, Aaron O'Toole, who's lost once in a spectacular fashion, that these people could fight another election despite, you know, having let down their parties. I, I think that that's not a great thing. We used to have that with folks like William Jennings Bryan. And yes, that's true. 2022 midterm predictions. I mentioned this briefly earlier. I just want to say that I do think Republicans will squeak by getting a majority in the House and um, I think the Senate will be close, but I think there, there's a good chance Republicans are going to be re regaining control. But I um, I don't necessarily think much more is going to get done. 
I'm very pessimistic for 2022. Now, 2024 looks a little bit more like, plus a lot could change by then politically. I, a lot does, can. I mean, let's face it, whatever happens in Congress, a lot of times it does, um, it depends on, um, you know, the overall direction of, sure, like the economy and stuff like that, but also like a lot of what Joe Biden does is it's reflected, even though it, a lot of times it's, it is a separate thing from what's going on in Congress. A lot, if he's not doing well, then, you know, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, all I know is sort of what all the real smart political analysts tell me. And I mean, yeah. from what they have to say, it seems like the consensus is pretty broad that like most midterms, the Democrats will make losses. You know, the ruling party will make make losses and the Republicans are, seem for that reason likely to retake. It's curious yeah. to imagine, uh, you know, the the Republicans taking the Senate and then sort of what that would mean for Biden's appointment agenda, you know, like a ability yeah. to appoint judges in particular, like if that's just going to really drag everything to a screeching halt, just because we know how Mitch McConnell operates as Senate majority leader and, you know, he's the <laughs> master of obstructionism. So. Yeah. I, uh, there's, it, it, it's going to be, Again, I, I I sound like a broken record sometimes, but gerrymandering, I, I think it's it's been so devastating. Uh, and it's clearly benefited Republicans more than Democrats, although, although Democrats are they're getting a little bit better at gerrymandering. I've noticed in some states they've they've uh, they've published some new maps. If you want to look, they're out there. Oh, is this for both of us? I think if you could start a fancy U.S. or Canadian political party with a real chance of winning, what would it be about? Core values and <laughs> priorities. Jeez, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess I would like a, a, a Canadian party that was consistent in its defense of, of individual rights and individual liberty and was sort of tried to come up with a kind of like one size fits all sort of theory, so to speak, of, of a sort of a vision of a kind of liberal uh in the sort of small l sense a liberal democratic canada that's based around individual rights and uh, you know not based around the idea i made a whole video about this concept of like the seven or the six different classes of canadian i would really like to see a canada that that seek, seeks to go beyond that that seeks to come up with like a theory of one class of canadian citizenship for everybody regardless of race gender geography language and so on yeah, I, I like a lot of that too. I I would probably go further and say integrity has to be another piece of the puzzle because I'm I'm kind of fed up with and it's probably not as big a problem in Canada, but in, in the United States, corruption has gotten out of control. With, I mean, it's everybody knows how unpopular Congress is, mostly because of the influence of of lobbyists and and special interests. And I know that sounds even cliche at this point, but it's still true. I mean, it's. Uh, there's a reason why cinema and mansion are wavering, uh, and it's not just it's not because they're principled, you know, because they could have been principled years ago, and they or I know cinema hasn't been around that long, but I it, it's it's they look first and foremost to their donors, and and they it seems like you know the the ones they really are who has their ears are the ones who help them stay in power and so that it's it makes sense it's the system we have but if we had a political party that that um up into that system made it harder for um you know corporate welfare to happen and special interest just to drive everything um that would be my priority i think uh this is kind of a i guess related from jeremy there but i Political union. I mean, we already have trade agreements that are, I would say, um, you know, it's funny that NAFTA was like all like, <laughs> and then now we have just basically a modified version of it. But I think, yeah, I think, so, I mean, the next, the next frontier, I think, is is mobility of labor. You know, because NAFTA protects, uh, you mm -hmm. know, free trade in in, in goods. But that's really kind of an, quite an old fashioned thing. And I think that was kind of like one of the great sort of missed opportunities of the renegotiation of NAFTA was that there was not a, an improvement of migration of, uh, of, of, of services, of people being able to cross the border the way that they can do in, in Europe. So I definitely think like that's kind of the next sort of frontier of, of the movement towards some sort of uh, union with the U.S. So that would be my kind of take on that. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I, 
I think ultimately, like, you're going to see this with more and more countries around the world um, because it's just, it's going to be economically advantageous, advantageous to do that. So um, I think we're caught up on questions for now. So, like, maybe, oh, well, wait, oh, oh, sorry. One more. Eugene, okay. he's got a lot of questions for us. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, why are urban areas more liberal? Oh, Okay, well, the, see, this is okay. I could probably okay. Let's hear your it's answer. Like those dang maps you saw, you see after election, like see how red the country is. It's yes, like a yes. Map, you're like, oh gosh. So this is actually quite simple. Um, there are plenty of conservative people that live in cities. Okay, there. In fact, a lot of times you have 35, 40, 45 percent people in cities that are conservative, but you don't see it, do you? Um, and so I think they're, they're not, that's the first thing is like, it's not as, as simple as these liberal cities, you know, in these conservative rural areas. Um, and the other thing to really consider too, is that there's just not many people that live in rural areas, like 80%, 70%, 70 to 80% of the United States is urban. So when, when I say that, I mean, either they live in a, in a city or a, sub, a suburb or an exurb, like on the outskirts of the city and heavily influenced by that city. Um, you just don't have people living out in the boonies anymore. And, and uh, you know, that's why things like the Postal Service and um, trying to have government involvement and in infrastructure for broadband internet is important for these reasons. But anyway, that's a digression. I'm digressing. I, the point is, it's like um, when you have a bunch of people in one place, like you just, it's going to be, you're going to tend to have like a, a mindset, like a, a culture form, I guess you should say. And it, it, even if it's just a slight majority, it's still going to be, I mean, we have a very red country in terms of the Senate over the last 15 years or 10, uh, 12 years, 11 years. And that's because of the power of these small states, these rural states, I think the, th the thing that you're missing is that most people probably lean to the left. <laughs> Let's just say the quiet part out loud here in the United States. Trump never had higher than 43% approval rating. Like it's not, it's, you know. It's, it's, I think, I think as well, like sort of answering the, the question is that, uh, you know, you can sometimes overstate the, urban as being sort of the key variable in that sentence, you can sort of say, well, what, what are the sort of the other things that define urban America, right? And you can sort of say, well, you know, it tends to be wealthier, it tends to be more diverse, tends to have a higher percentage of people that have university educations, things like this. And all of those things also- correlate. Oh, you're saying so smart people are liberal. Is that what you're saying, JJ? I'm saying that these are things that correlate with voting <laughs> liberal, right? And so I think that in some respects, it's it can be less important to sort of focus on exactly where people are living, because as you sort of said, like there is lots of uh, diversity within urban areas politically as much as anything else. But when you look at the kind of people that vote liberal, maybe sort of try to analyze them as individuals and look at the what sort of variables correlate with that, uh, you know, with with at the individual level, because I think ultimately, like, you know, anyone can live anywhere. But when we think of cities as being more liberal, we're talking monolithic. about the Yeah, they're not. And we're talking about yeah. they're not they're not monolithic, but they do have a high proportion of people who tend to vote uh, liberal. And, and what I'm just sort of saying is that those people vote liberal because they have the characteristics of people that vote liberal. You Seems had a like much a bit better of a truism. Answer Your answer was so much better than mine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so unions, do you see there being a more EU styled unions on other continents? I mean, we're already, there's a uh, Africa, there's been unions uh, that have, uh, I mean, there's the African Union. I'm not sure if that is quite comparable. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's the, uh, what's the one that's in Southeast Asia? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's quite the same as like the EU, though. I mean, it, it's it's hard to sort of it's hard to say, like, because I'm just not an expert of international yeah, organizations. Really. This is like what like our old buddy Canubus, he he loves this topic. So he'd probably be able to answer that, yeah. that question. Is he better. still around? <laughs> that's 
That is a good question. Uh, I, I'm frankly, oh yeah. So um, it is uh, S-E-A-C-E-E-A-N, Southeast Asia Union. Probably saw about it in the Canubus video. All right. Well, uh, we probably should wrap this up here. It's yeah. been two and a half hours. So um, I'm good. I'm gonna... I still have to do some more editing, Matthew, to get oh my, my video God. ready for tomorrow. Right. So yeah. You got a video tomorrow. Um, I do. Ooh. How do I get rid of that comment now? That comment might just stay on the screen forever. Carlos. Oh, there we go. Okay. There you go. Well, thank you, JJ, for doing this. Uh, thank you for having me. We were looking for an excuse to collaborate again because uh, so many of our, our viewers actually request it. So I was like, well, let's just do a live stream. And then, yeah, excuse to get to know each other more and have a great conversation. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matthew. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was great. All right. Well, everyone in the chat, thanks for being here and, or, and watching at home. And I'll leave this up thank so you. later. Have a good night. Night, night.